Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, I am one of your hosts for today, John DeLynn. It is October 18th, right? 2023. And I am here with my partner in truth and righteousness, Margie. Hey, Margie, how's hey. it going? It's good it's to have you. It's going really well. Thank you. Um, we are uh, this week and, and last week, by the time this is uh, released, we are in the middle of covering... Uh, you know, basically, um, a bunch of stories and reporting tied to this book, Visions of Glory. This book, Visions of Glory, uh, is 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 um, penned by a man named John Pontius, who has passed away. Um, he uh, he is is dictating or transcribing some near death experiences of a man in the book called Spencer. Uh, who with that, and that's a pseudonym, uh, but the actual name of the man who is behind Spencer in this near death experience book is Tom Harrison. Tom Harrison. Tom Harrison is a very well known therapist along the Wasatch Front. And the reason why I'm talking about all this, why we're talking about all this, including the Visions of Glory book, is because we have discovered that uh, Tom Harrison appears to be kind of like the Wizard of Oz, kind of like the spiritual leader or the mentor for Julie Rowe, um, for Chad and Lori, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow, of course, the murders that uh, you all know about uh, from that, but also Jody Hildebrand and Connections, and finally um, the Eight Passengers, Ruby Frankie stuff, and Tim Ballard, and OUR. All, what do all those different tragic and horrendous stories have in common? They have their roots in um, having everyone both read uh, this book, Visions of Glory, about end time, second coming. I call it Mormon neo fundamentalism, but also prepperism. Uh, and uh, most or all of the people that I just mentioned have had direct interactions with and or relationships with Tom Harrison and this book, Visions of Glory. So uh, that's a prelude to my introduction of our guests for today. Our guests for today are Kim and Josh Coffin. And um, just to let you know ahead of time, we're going to be talking about a lot of themes, including scrupulosity, perfectionism, uh, being raised by very conservative, I will say neo-fundamentalist type parents, but in, in Kim's case, uh, as I understand it, Kim's father is one of the co-leaders of uh, the internet community called Avow, or I think Preparing a People, but it's basically, maybe that's different, but it's we'll talk one. about that. It's basically leaders in the neo-fundamentalist Mormon prepper community. And uh, that's the family, that's one of the families that Kim Coffin made a name being... Oh, sorry, Perrette. Per Perrette. Perrette. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's that's the family Kim grew up in. So one of the main things for today is going to be uh, Kim and Josh and being raised in very conservative, almost neo-fundamentalist Mormon families, and then uh, how that's played out. Uh, we'll also have uh, possibly some themes of abuse and, um, and of course, faith, faith journeys. So without any further ado... Kim and Josh Coffin, welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you so much for having us today. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we really appreciate you coming all the way from St. George. Is mm -hmm. that right? St. George. Yeah. What would you want to add to the introduction or correct about the introduction? Because I like to give people a sense for what the interview is about. So sure. The avow stands for another voice of warning. Mm -hmm. So for those who are looking it up online, that's kind of the acronym A V O W. Mm -hmm. Another voice of warning, and and yeah, we're just we have three kids. We live in St. George, Utah, um, and we both went to BYU Idaho together. And so, talk about our our journey together and Kim's family as well as mine. So, okay, I, Kim, anything you want to add? No, I think I think that covers it. Yeah, okay. we're excited to talk with you today. Okay, and and y'all, I guess it's it's uh, this isn't why we had you on. We have you on for your story, but you you guys also have a, a prominent YouTube channel that I actually know almost nothing about. 
Um, but do you do you want to just mention that really quick, yeah, or would you rather you not mention a, that? A quick intro. It's okay. called Sweet Red Poppy. Yeah. And it's a crafting and sewing channel. Um, we instruct people on how to use craft tech. So think sewing machines, Cricut, Glowforge, anything that makes um, crafting easier. And started that about seven, eight years ago. And it took off really pretty in a big way over during COVID. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I always have, a, I mean, social media is the way people are being influenced these days. And, and it's a, it's a interesting and a sometimes fun and a very challenging business. So I always respect learning about people's uh, successes and challenges. So anyway, most importantly, welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. We're really honored to hear your stories today. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Okay, so uh, I think we'll probably do this in two parts. Part one will be kind of what it's like growing up with mm -hmm. prepper slash neo fundamentalist Mormon neo fundamentalist Mormon parents. I will want to talk a little bit about when this book Visions of Glory enters into your family's lives. Mm -hmm. I, I understand it was it was pretty uh, a fundamental part of your family dynamics. Is that right? Yeah, and it came out two years after I graduated high school, um, but definitely, definitely changed the way that we were parented. And um, I think it echoes a lot of other books that have come out about similar topics. Yeah. Um, so it's it's an interesting one. Yeah, yeah. All right, and so um, I guess maybe Kim, let's start with with your story a little bit, okay. and. Uh, and and then we'll we'll integrate you, Josh, as well, and we'll do part one maybe up through when the your testimony cracks start to develop, and then part two will be about your faith journeys and then your reconstruction. Does that sound all right? Sounds great. Sounds great. Yeah. So we'll we'll split up into two. All right, Kim uh, and, and Margie, anything you want to say before we jump in? No, I'm just I'm excited. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, all right, Kim, where does your Mormon story begin? <laughs> um, where do you want me to start? Just... <laughs> so where, where, where were you born and, um, and siblings and, okay. and tell us a bit about your parents as well, if, okay. you, if you're comfortable. Yeah. So I was born in Colorado, um, in 1992, I have a twin brother and a younger brother and a younger sister. Um, my father is a convert to the church, so he converted in his late 20s. Um, my mother was raised LDS her whole life. Um, they met after she, she, she was married before and got a divorce. During her divorce process, she met my dad. Um, and that was about, I think, the time he was taking discussions with the missionaries. And shortly after, they got married in the temple. Um, and few, I don't know, a year and a half, two years later, I think they had me and my twin brother. Okay. And your dad was in the military too, right? Yeah. Before that, my dad was in the military. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So he was a convert, not, yeah. not a pioneer stock. No, Mormon. Yeah. which converting is interesting. Um, he grew up as an only child and really didn't have, um, a relationship or contact with his father and, it wasn't until he joined the church and learned about family history that he found out more information about his family. And he got back into contact with his father that I, I don't think he had seen his father since he was like one or two. Um, and his father had actually joined the Mormon church as well and had a new family and he found out he had siblings. Um, so that was so interesting to join a church and then find out that the father that you had had little to no contact with your entire life was also a member of mm -hmm. that church. That would seem providential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. And do you have a sense for what type of upbringing your mom had at all? Um, How conservative it was? Very conservative. She was raised in the South and I believe her father was a bishop at one point. She's one of nine children, the oldest girl. She has two older brothers. Um, so a pretty strict Mormon upbringing. Um, yeah, what else? Yeah. 
Very conservative family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very strict. Okay. Big, big family. Big family. Big family. Big family in terms of like nine kids. Nine kids. Yeah. 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 Lots of brothers. Lots of yeah. sports. Yeah. Uh, very, was it North Carolina? Uh, uh, in North Carolina. North yeah, Carolina. they moved around a little bit, but I think they were always mostly in the South. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And very dedicated to the church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So, what uh, do you have any really formative Mormon early childhood memories that you think are really important to your story or would be? Um, maybe even different than what the average Mormon experience might be, if that even exists? I think what would really set my childhood experiences apart would be having a father who was very into preparedness. Um, Like I remember some of my earliest childhood memories are going to the cannery um, in Colorado, having like those little metal cans. Those were all under our bunk bed, I remember we would get them out and like slide around on them, try to walk on them. So I remember <laughs> even when we lived in the teeny tiniest little apartment with six people, we still had, we still made room for food storage. It was that important that we were always prepared for what my dad said was coming and was coming, coming soon. So your, your dad believed that the second coming was nigh from a very early age? Yes, yes. We were told all the time that we were the chosen generation that it was going to happen during our lifetime and that we needed to be prepared both sp- spiritually as well as physically. So we needed to have food storage ready and be prepared because it could happen at any point. So I'm curious as a child um, within, so experiencing messages and even like a lived reality in your home, mm-hmm. Did that feel, how did that feel for you as a young child, a young girl? Was it like a, did you then fear what was coming? Did you feel comforted because you were prepared? Like how, how did that feel for you? As a child, I had a lot of fear growing up, worrying. I have a lot of anxiety. And so I think my anxiety tended to focus on what's coming and will I be righteous enough to be one of the people that's saved or that is called out. Um, So a lot of fear. I had terrible nightmares as a child, just always worried about what was coming. Um, Mm. And so, yeah, uh, definitely a huge theme of fear throughout my childhood of were we good enough? Was I good enough? Was I doing everything that I could? And that Mm. was, that was difficult. So can you, paint for us an understanding of what you were taught about the calamity and the violence and the carnage of the second coming. So you're a kid, let's just say you're a highly conscientious kid. Let's say you have scrupulosity and a lot of anxiety. What, what was your vision of what would happen when Christ came in terms of violence and mayhem and destruction Mm -hmm. for, for those who weren't righteous to know what you were fearing, right? Yeah. I'm trying to think of, as a child, what my views of that were. Um, and it can even be what what you've come to learn. Yeah, yeah. Because like, I, I don't know that I... Paint a picture of the second come, what precedes the second coming of Jesus. There was a lot of fear for me about... Um, my dad would quote so much, um, what's the scripture about sorting the wheat from the tares? Mm-hmm. He would always quote that scripture specifically. And it was so unsettling to me because he would tell us like anyone in our congregation could be a tear and they could so easily fall away from the church. And they, most of the people in our congregation are not going to be worthy enough for the second coming or for the call out. Um, And so then you just have like this terrible feeling inside, like, am I one of those people? And I just don't know it. (laughs) Um, Oh, and that was so unsettling as a child, just always feeling like maybe I won't be enough or maybe I'm not righteous enough. And then have, we spoke about earlier that I, I do have OCD and um, one of the types of OCD that I have is scrupulosity. So scrupulosity really is a religious form of OCD where you have obsessive thoughts and then compulsions that make you feel safe. So for me... Um, it felt like we were always living this higher law than everyone else in the general Mormon population. That's how I was how I was raised to believe, was that my father had this information that most 
normal Mormons didn't have access to. And we, with that knowledge, would be more prepared for the second coming if we were righteous. And it was kind of an odd viewpoint to go to church. And he definitely um, seemed to think that like some of the Mormons were lesser Mormons. They weren't as righteous. They weren't as informed. And um, mm. OCD can be so so tricky within the church. Mm-hmm. So I had a lot of like little rituals that I would do. Um, when you have an obsessive thought, like it feels like it just circulates. It comes over and over and over. And it can be very distressing when you don't know that what you're struggling with is your mental health. You just think uh, that it's some evil spirit that is coming into your mind. And that's kind of what we were taught was if you have a thought that keeps happening, it's an evil spirit that's trying to get in. And, and, I, and I don't want to derail your story by talking about visions of glory so much. But, you know, I'm reading visions of glory right now. And this idea of demonic embodied or disembodied or never embodied spirits entering your body is is like a core theme of this book. And this book came out in 2012. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense for whether those beliefs that your parents were teaching you as a Mormon child preceded the this book? Definitely. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we were rereading this book this past week because I was trying to get a better feel for when did I start learning these principles? Because a lot of the things that I was taught by my father were not necessarily things that were taught in mainstream Mormonism. And I'm still trying to figure out what is the fundamentalist viewpoint versus mainstream Mormonism. And it's a little bit tricky, but I know that some of those things I was taught definitely predated the publishing of this book. And I think this book echoes a lot of other books and ideas that we've seen from other more of those fund- fundamentalist believers, those the prepper community. So I think that idea that the evil spirits were outside of your body and that at any time if you had an evil thought that they could come in or that if you put any substance into your body that you were welcoming them into your body, that definitely predated the that book being published. Yeah, I can just say just as someone that's been, you know, 54 years studying Mormonism, in the 80s when I was getting my church education, you know, possession, demonic possession was absolutely a thing. Exorcism was taught. And this idea of evil and good spirits being able to influence you, that that's all, that is core Mormon doctrine because there's this whole Mormon theology of the preexistence mm-hmm. and all of God's spirit children. And then a third of the hosts of heaven are cast out. And those evil third of God's children are sent to earth and they follow Satan and Lucifer and those spirits can enter your body. So I, I want to be careful. We Half of our audience has never been Mormon mm-hmm. and it would be wrong to call this idea of, of spiritual, almost demonic possession. It would be wrong to call that a fringe Mormon belief mm-hmm. because it was a core Mormon belief to what I was taught. Also, a, 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 an obsession with the with the second coming and the mm-hmm. and the second coming of Jesus in the end times. It's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Latter Day Saints means we're in the end times, and Mormons have been obsessing about the second coming of Jesus since the founding of the church. So it's difficult because while I agree with you that your dad and parents were not mainstream, mm-hmm. I don't want to make it sound like those beliefs are out of the mainstream. Yeah. Maybe they're not, they're less emphasized in the past few decades. Still, in my opinion, very core Mormon doctrine. Now, please disagree with me if you see it differently. No, no, I don't disagree at all. Um, As we've transitioned into the ex-Mormon community and spoken with more people, we do see some of these things are echoed throughout other people's experiences. And it's interesting to hear their experiences because it's not necessarily written anywhere. I don't know that some of these things were written by prophets per se. Um, but again, a lot of these things were taught at in Sunday school or um, in different lessons, but I don't know that they were necessarily approved by the prophet. Or necessarily in the manuals, but they yeah. were definitely spoken about. There's a lot of fear mongering that happened. I know she's spoken a lot about mm-hmm. how it's always a culture of fear. There's not enough food. The time mm-hmm. is running Scarcity. out. Scarcity. Mm-hmm. Scarcity complex. There's also a lot around your being watched. I think you talked mm-hmm. a lot about, and this kind of threw me for a loop, um, 
that she felt that the Holy Ghost was always watching her. Mm -hmm. That you even, do you want to tell that? The bathing suit thing? Yeah. So I feel like with OCD, you have these highs and lows. And sometimes when you're in a high where you're really experiencing a lot of those intrusive thoughts, um, it can be really a struggle. And I remember when I was having one of those struggles, um, one of the things that I was taught was that the evil spirits could see everything that you were doing, but that God could also see everything that you were doing. So at all times you were being watched, which is an unsettling thought to think that everything that you do is Mm -hmm. being viewed by multiple people. And so as a child, I took that as, well, if they can hear every thought that I'm having, if they can see everything that I'm doing, then am I safe in the shower? (laughs) Which is ridiculous looking back on it, but it was a real fear that I had. And so I remember for a while I had this bathing suit that I would sneak into the bathroom and I had it in the cupboard and I would just pull it out when I needed to shower and I would wear it because I was so afraid that God could see me naked and I didn't want a man seeing me naked. Um, I didn't want evil spirits seeing me naked and just looking back on that, it's so unsettling to think about that as a child, I was worried about not feeling safe in my own body because I was being watched at all times. And that you might've welcomed the evil spirits by not fighting off the thought or Mm -hmm. that it was your fault if there were evil spirits nearby. Like there was always Mm -hmm. a guilt complex or a shame around Mm -hmm. that if you let the spirit in, it's your fault. Or if they're nearby, it's it's on on you, which is an eight-year-old kid, an eight-year-old girl. Like what in the world? Absolutely. I'm kind of hearing the, you know, you speaking, John, a little bit about mainstream Mormonism and it having some of these um, elements in the the sort of, you know, belief experience profile of, of um, mainstream Mormonism. What I'm hearing the difference as you're talking mm-hmm. is just the level of focus being placed on it. That's different from... I'll just say my experience within Mormonism and the level of like intensity around it as well. And living in a place of just kind of whether it's spiritual emergency or, you know, this kind of impending doom to your soul, whether that's like what you're saying with like spirits being or your, your thoughts or like when you're trying to take a shower, this, you know, and that, that to me does feel like different than what I experienced in me. It feels like much more intense, focused, um, yeah, dire. Yeah, that definitely is different than the experience of most people that I've spoken with. I didn't know that it was so different growing up, though. I thought the thoughts that I were ha- that I was having, that was similar to what everyone else was experiencing. And I wasn't aware that I had OCD or that there were, I mean, we I wasn't aware that mental health was even a thing growing up. That wasn't my parents made fun of mental health growing up. So there would so have that been. was a part of the culture is making fun of, oh. yes, of sort of yes. psychotherapy or therapy or yeah. psychiatry. Or any of that Definitely. Stuff. Yes. Oh. Yeah. It's still something to this day that my father makes fun of uh-huh. and everyone in our family suffers with their mental health. Mm-hmm. And Silently. it's really, really sad to see that, that I think, Everyone in my family has been on anxiety medication at some point outside of my father. And that's something that he mocks. That's just a spiritual shortcoming. If you're having negative thoughts, then you're not living righteously enough. It's a weakness. He sees it as a weakness. And I'll just say again, that was core Mormon doctrine. So if you read Mormon doctrine by Bruce R. McConkie, there was heavy skepticism and even contempt for mental health professionals. Mm -hmm. And... I'd say the mainstream church today has moved away from that some, Mm -hmm. but they haven't really purged it. And I don't know how they would purge it from the general membership. So there's still strong strains of that in conservative Mormonism. Yeah. Margie. I'm so to me, I'm really getting a sense for like a very terrifying world as a, as a child and that you have this sense of like, how do I, how do I cope? How do I, how do I survive this world and my home and my life that 
uh, that has been created. When you look back and you've brought up OCD a couple of times already, um, you know, when do you remember, and, and maybe this is difficult, like, you know, your eight-year-old self or your seven-year-old self might not have known it was mm-hmm. OCD, but now looking back, like, when do you see that coping emerging as a way to just sort of survive this existence as it's been painted for you? I'm not sure I, I fully understand the the coping being uh, OCD, OCD, trying to oh, okay. control now this thought thing that yes. now has been infused with, you know, spirits and demons. Mm-hmm. And it's in your bad when that is happening to you. Like, do you have a sense for when mm-hmm. in your timeline you're like, yeah, I can see now some of those roots of OCD coming mm-hmm. forward? Oh, definitely. Um I think that those those intrusive thoughts probably started maybe a few years before baptism. Um, I know that they really heightened after my baptism, after I felt like I was accountable for mm-hmm. everything that I thought or did, but I know that they definitely started before. So probably I would say six or seven, I started yeah. having those intrusive thoughts. Yeah. Well, let's keep going with your story. So, what well, you know, kind of, let's let's keep going with how it was for you as a child and as a teen, uh, with super conservative Mormon prepper parents, basically. Trying to think of where else to to go. Uh, let's see. So we lived in Colorado for quite a while, um, and I think somewhere in there, that's when. My dad got involved with the prepping community. I don't know exactly what year he became involved. Um, I remember my mom joking that he wanted to move us to a commune and or a compound and sell all of our belongings and prepare for the last days. My mother was never she wasn't she didn't hold all of the same beliefs that he did. Mm. No, it was always sort of sure, honey. Right. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. interesting. Go along to get along. She would kind of laugh off his more intense beliefs. And I viewed that as maybe a shortcoming on her part at the time. Like, oh, she isn't as righteous or she doesn't understand as much as my father does, because clearly he is living this higher law than anyone. And I didn't feel like she quite understood, which I think is a common theme with scrupulosity of thinking that people are living like on different planes and that some people have that higher knowledge and understand that and other people just maybe aren't quite on the same level, which I feel like sounds like such a terrible way to view humanity. And I hate that that is, was a view that I had, um, but that was how we were raised to think. And growing up when you're thinking about your dad Mm -hmm. and your relationship with your dad, How would you talk about uh, him as a figurehead in your home and what you were conditioned to think about him? Hmm. My father was very strict, um, very abusive, very... He's not a kind man. And so... I had a lot of fear about the second coming, but also about my father. Mm. So our relationship wasn't great, but throughout my life, whenever, um, I would always doubt myself. I never doubted that there was a problem or a fault with him. It was always, if I didn't measure up to his standard, it was just some personal failing. I, I wasn't enough. I wasn't righteous enough. If I didn't understand, it was because I had a shortcoming. Um, I never questioned if there was anything wrong with his beliefs or I just thought he knows everything because in the church we are taught that our fathers are the head of the household and that they receive divine inspiration and revelation for our family. And I never questioned that belief from the church either. I just believed my father knows what's best. He will always lead us. He will 
never make a mistake. And so anything that he did do, if it was wrong or hurtful, I didn't question it. I just thought I didn't understand. I don't fully understand God's plan for me. So was it a harsh form of Mormonism? Definitely. In terms of belief, but also behavior, anything you want to say about kind of the this harsh brand of Mormonism, of yeah. prepper Mormonism? It was very harsh. Um, I guess to give background, my father was in the army. He is very strict, kind of, I almost feels as though he thought he could run his family like <laughs> they were all in the army. Um, there wasn't a lot of love. There wasn't a lot of physical affection. Empathy. It was very, very little empathy. Mm. It was, yeah, it was very harsh. Mm. I'm curious um, in growing up if there were either hobbies or places outside your home or people, like, were there places of softness for you? I love that question. There definitely were. Uh, I loved being outside as a child. I would spend so much time outside because that was like my safe, my safe place. We've talked about this a, a lot. I'm sorry. I was hoping I would be so emotional. Mm -hmm. Um, being within the walls of my home never felt safe. My parents were both very abusive. And so I would spend a lot of time outside and just, I had a, a wild imagination. I would just go outside and pretend that I was in my own safe world. Mm, and I love that. There was this big tree and I would climb it all the time. And I just have fond memories of that. I think you enjoyed like the streams and the crawdads um, in North Carolina when you'd visit your extended family. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about that. Yeah. Drives in the Colorado mountains. Mm -hmm. there, and there, there were good memories with my parents too. I, I don't want to frame it all as being terrible. There were things that they did that I very much don't agree with, but there were good, good parts of them too. <laughs> Thank you for being willing to talk about something so hard. And I'm so... Morgan and I, all of us, are, are so sorry to hear about the abuse. Um, I'm curious, that, you know, there there will be abusive people in and out of Mormonism and in and out of religion. Sometimes what we like to really shine a spotlight on is a, abuse or harm that can be tied to theology or church teachings or beliefs. So is there anything you can share about ways that the abuse or harshness was tied to beliefs or fears of certain behaviors or, or beliefs or theologies ab about how the world works or how God works or how Satan works that could have informed and even fed the, the, some of that abuse? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. With whatever detail you want to share. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, I think within Mormonism, there are a lot of teachings within mainstream Mormonism, not just necessarily like those fringe groups. There are a lot of teachings that support more abusive styles of parenting. Sure. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. Fear-based parenting mm -hmm. for sure. Um, mm -hmm. all the time, just sort of like the emotional, the yelling, the just the, and even, even the physical, right? The emotional and the physical abuse um, to, to put the fear of God in you so that you'll behave. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you can even look at the Bible and see scriptures like uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. And that was one of my father's favorite ones to quote. So that was one of the ways he used the scriptures to justify his behaviors. So I guess that is biblical, that, mm -hmm. that phrase. Sure. Yeah. I also I say there's, it is. Yeah. But also say too that the um there's a lot of, of worship for him as a man. Mm -hmm. 
it was a very patriarchal home from what you've mm-hmm. said, right? That you definitely the, dad could do no wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And what dad said was final law mm-hmm. and word. And that's just mm-hmm. something you had to deal with. Yeah. Even your mother. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Even she wasn't really able to stand up to him or voice how she felt. It was very much, it, it felt like a dictatorship. And it wasn't until I was in college and I was studying marriage and family therapy that I started to piece together, oh, this was not a healthy dynamic. I'm sitting in my marriage and therapy classes and we're talking about different styles of parenting and how parents interact with each other. And I started to realize, oh, all the things that you're telling me parents should not do and the styles of parenting that we should not work with, those are the ones that I grew up with. And that's not great to hear, but I hadn't ever questioned it until probably college. And, um, but I think, I think some of those things happen throughout a lot of Mormon families that physical violence is excused because the father is allowed to do what he sees best and should instill, should instill the fear of God in his children. Yeah. We mm. do see that a lot, unfortunately. And then <clears throat> the, the belief that like Jesus is coming any day he, we have to be pure. We have to be the chosen. Uh, Satan and his minions are all around us trying to get us. We'll be tortured and destroyed at Jesus' second coming if we're not righteous. So there is there, do you think there's kind of a theological or religious sense of intensity that may have even been sincere on your dad's part? where he's just saying the stakes are super high. It can be really bad if we're not good. It's coming any moment. Mm -hmm. We've got to just amp up the intensity. Oh, definitely. And I have like this part of my heart that hurts for him because I do think so much of his life has been lived with so much fear and worry and anxiety about the future. I know that he doesn't necessarily believe in anxiety, but I can see that he struggles with anxiety and then it can be really painful. And I think one of his coping mechanisms for dealing with anxiety and never feeling like he was safe or had enough was finding the prepping community. Because when you have an answer to a question, it makes you feel safe. And especially if you're struggling with OCD, you have those intrusive thoughts like the world is ending, the world is ending, the world is ending. And it repeats. The compulsion is I can go research about how the world is ending and then I can do X, Y, Z to make myself feel safe. And so he definitely had these coping mechanisms that provided a sense of safety or a feeling of control and viewing him from that lens. It makes me feel bad for him. I I feel terrible that he lived with so much fear. That's painful. It's painful for anyone, even if they, even if they are abusive in their behavior, like they're still, I still hold a lot of pain for him that he grew up in a family without a father, never having enough. And that that theme carried throughout from his childhood, carried throughout adulthood and ended him up in this prepping community where there is so much fear and pain. Mm. And they are literal believers too, right? I mean, he's a very literal believer. Like the end of it's actually going to yeah. come, right? Mm-hmm. I do think there are sometimes members who don't take that as serious. And there's others that really dive into the literal belief that the end of times is here. Mm-hmm. And I felt that very much so even just when I met you was that, you know, he's ready mm-hmm. to, for the end of times, you know, loading his own ammo and his guns and, mm-hmm. and, his, and the, the food storage, the bunker, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Can you talk about like prepper... I'll say prepper materialism, but like it's a lot more than just food storage, right? So much more than food storage. It's thinking through everything that you might need if every, you know, if crap hits the fan, what would you possibly need to have? And it's What's the type of calamity that that preppers envision happening? Mm-hmm. So it depends on whose visions or dreams you're ascribing to. <laughs> and there are a lot of dreams and visions within that community. I think a lot of them are similar and that 
there's an earthquake that happens throughout Utah, that it causes mass destruction, that there is some sort of virus that happens that wipes out you know, half or more of the population. Nuclear threats. Nuclear threats. Uh, We've heard them all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Keep going. I mean, just mm-hmm. paint the picture. It's very scary, some of the dreams and visions that people have shared. Um, the, the visions of glory is talking about like Salt Lake being flooded, mm-hmm. like six foot sprouts mm-hmm. of water coming out of the earth. The volcano thing in Yellowstone was always one that we mm-hmm. heard a lot about living heard in Idaho. Before. And we're you know in the areas we lived in. So just imagine any terrible natural disaster that you can times ten. Like what is going to happen that would be so terrible that it just wipes out our infrastructure and suddenly we have to live off only the resources that are within our home. And our government and our government and like is mar- probably gone as well. And, and marauders are you know everywhere killing people mercilessly. And that was really one of the ones that stuck with me was this fear of well if everything right. breaks down and we're stuck in our home and we're only living off of food storage and everyone knows that we have food storage and everyone else didn't prepare. And right. they are not prepared because the they're field. not living they're the top to tier. Because, mm-hmm. yes, if, and one of the phrases on a vow is, if you are pre- prepared, you need not fear. And that was something that my father said all the time. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, again, a coping mechanism for him to not have to feel fear, which feel, fear is very painful and unsettling was to prepare so buying all of these material goods to make yourself feel better. So in our home, it was not just food. It was like toilet paper and... Um, Can I tell them about all the, and the stuff I was women's shopping? hygiene, like any sort of thing that you might need over the next year. It's uh, cigarettes. Alcohol and cigarettes were Alcohol. stored in excess in the basement. Because you would need to have those things to barter, not necessarily for yourself, but... If your neighbor who does I didn't smoke, know that. if he has something, then you need to have cigarettes so that you can trade with him. For his pork or his mm-hmm. lamb or his whatever. Or whatever it, it was is. It's all about and if they have addictions, right? So if they yes. have addictions like to alcohol and cigarettes yes. that you would you would be, you know, the Wild West leader. Yeah. Right? Of you'd be the trade center basically. So interesting. And you have the guns to defend yourself. You have the self made ammo. Mm -hmm. And you have all the things you can barter with. Wait, you're making your own ammo? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. That's the first thing I learned when I got to their house. The machine press, and we all know how to use it because you you will need to reload and learn how to make your own. Are these shotguns or actual rifles? Every kind of gun you can imagine. (laughs) Every gun. He has a huge gun case filled with guns. And we learned from the time, Mm. probably under age eight, he started taking us shooting so that we would learn how to use a gun and that we needed to be comfortable with it. Yep. I was never comfortable with it. Um, mm. As a child, that was very unsettling to be forced to shoot guns and to learn about how to defend yourself. He also added food storage when we got married. Oh, Wait, yes. really quick. Uh, assault rifles level yes. kind of guns? He you the, know more. I the, don't, I'm not super familiar with everything. Uh, Pistols, shotguns, guns. all kinds of rifles, and then definitely the AR-15, AK-47 type type modules. He'd have all of that. Oh. And he would build them. And, and this is kind of common in Idaho where they have mo- usually resided. It was in Idaho mm-hmm. in the, the last decade, but, you know, building your own AR-15, right. From the different parts dealers, that's a big deal. And yeah. going out and shooting. I mean, some of the time that was the first activities we did is part of me, me being part of your family was to go out and shoot mm-hmm. and to hold mm-hmm. the big one. And he loved how what scared was, I was. was. He thought it was, big one? and I grew up with scouts, so I had shotguns and stuff, but a fifty caliber. Oh, uh, I don't know if he we got that one out, no, but he, he did, did. He? yeah. Not with me, but maybe with you. There, mm. there were a lot of guns, and it caused me a lot of fear as a child. A lot of safes, a lot of huge storage wow. for guns. Can I ask? Just uh, like, it sounds expensive. It it definitely is an expensive hobby or thing to be doing. Because there's tents and trailers too, right? Uh huh. Yes, and we had lots. Yes, it was not just the food storage. It was all the things that you would possibly need. If you have to also, the idea was you wouldn't just be living in your home. If everything happened, ideally after a period of time, you would be called out because there's this idea of 
the 144,000. Okay. Did you say called out? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to just give a shout out to my friend, Lauren, um, Matthias, uh, Johnson, Lauren Johnson, Matthias. Uh, but she, she runs a, a YouTube channel called hidden true crime. She's been covering preppers, Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, and, and the, you know, all this stuff for a long time. And she said that one of the really interesting things associated with your dad, who is one of the leaders slash co-founders of, mm -hmm. of, of Al, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was, um, this idea of a call out. Mm -hmm. And she asked me to ask you whether your dad came up with the idea of the call out, mm -hmm. whether that, whether that was an avowal thing or whether that predated your dad and maybe just describe what it is as well. Yeah, I was trying to gain some additional insight into that before we came because I'm not positive where that idea comes from. I remember it being repeated so many times growing up, this idea of a call out and then tell cities. us what the call out is. So from my understanding, and I may not, I did not dive as deep as some of the people in this community did. So I, I probably have a limited knowledge when it comes to this. My understanding was that some of these terrible things would happen in the world and they would be natural disasters that would happen. Multiple natural disasters would happen. And then the people that were the most righteous in the LDS church would be called out after a certain amount of time to live in tent cities. So you needed to have everything ready to go live in this tent with your family. So you would be bringing your food storage from what I understood to the tent city. Someone would come with a big truck and you would load it all up and we would all be taken away. And it would only be the most righteous. It wouldn't like our whole neighborhood was Mormon, but all of those Mormons would not be called out. Because they weren't righteous enough. Because they were not they righteous They were not enough. top tier. <laughs> yes, they were not living the higher the law. Highest, Again, yeah. like you have these scrupulous ideas that are right. just so harmful. But I didn't question it growing up because the leader of my home was telling me these things and I trusted him. The yeah. number of times in our marriage where she's asked me, is that something you remember from your Mormon story? Yeah. I'd say, no, no, that's no, not that's something that I ever mm -hmm. heard of. Or, yeah. So... So you, you, your dad believed that you guys had to prepare to end up in a tent city mm -hmm. and to be able to transport all your storage and everything. Yep. Bug out to bag. To the tent city. A bug out. What are bug out bags? Did he talk about bug outs? Like just being ready to go at any time, having mm -hmm. a vehicle gassed and ready and mm -hmm. a bug out bag with all the essentials and, mm -hmm. you know, a, oh. a majority of things you could quickly grab and. Always being prepared. Like we could never let the. We could never let the fuel in our cars go low. Like it couldn't go under half a tank. Wow. My mom would always let hers go low. <laughs> um, but my father always kept above half a tank just in case. Of guess. Because you never know what might happen and you need to be prepared. At any moment. At any moment. It just sounds like a really stressful totally. way to live. Totally. Even it was. It really <laughs> and expensive, was. And, you know? and very expensive. And I cannot tell you the number of people who have contacted me after we have left Mormonism to let me know just like heartbreaking situations where they've seen either themselves or their families have gone and cashed out their retirement mm -hmm. and they've used all of their money. It just like breaks my heart. They've used all of this money to buy all of these preparedness supplies so that they can be ready for this call out that they hope they're righteous enough to be a part of. Uh, mm. And it's so painful to know that my father, it feels as though he's preying on these people. How so? The fear mongering that goes on in this forum. And so as this forum owner, he does this thing called these group, group buy-ins and mm -hmm. he will contact a company. So say it's a tent manufacturer and he'll say, he'll negotiate a deal, like a wholesale order. If we have X, Y, Z tents that we're going to purchase, can we get it for a lower price? So he'll do a group buy-in. So say this month is the tent buy-in. So everyone, you need to get your tent because we need to be ready for tent cities. And it's always 
he's always doing these group buy-ins and people are always spending money trying to get all of the things ready to be prepared. So your dad <sighs> was monetizing this fear yes. yeah. by stoking group purchases yes. that he would take a, a profit from. Yes. And you're, you're pretty sure of that? Oh, 100%. Oh, I would hear him tracking how much money he was making on each buyout. And if it wasn't making enough money, he was visibly upset by it. We probably mm -hmm. should cover what ABOW is, just so for well, the let's, viewers. Okay, I we have to get there sure. a thousand percent. Yeah. Some of this is pre-AVOW, right? I'm not positive when he joined AVOW or when oh, okay. he got into the prepper community. I don't know where that originated so from. So for you, there wasn't a, a clear marker of like, whoa, dad's doing internet stuff now kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, there was a clear... Let's see, when I... What are your earliest memories of him being involved in some sort of internet-based prepper stuff? Do you even have an early memory of that? Was I mean, it before all college? All throughout my life, there was prepper stuff going on. So okay. I don't know which resources he was getting that information from. Um, I, I guess know. when were... Do you have earlier, earliest memories of him being a leader... A leader. In the prepper so community. He didn't begin to be a leader in the prepper community until probably I was in like middle school because okay. we ended up moving. So we lived in Colorado for a while. We lived in Arizona for a few years. And then while we were living in Arizona, he decided that's when I know that he really got heavily involved in a vow. And that's when we moved to Rigby, Idaho, because that was one of the locations that would be ideal to be in mm -hmm. when the call out happened. Why Rigby, Idaho? Was it was there a sense for where the call out 10 cities would most likely be? So Roger Young, the founder of Avow, he had dreams and visions and he has several books. Um, one of the books does specifically call out Yukon, which I believe is is Alaska? No, I, I believe it was Idaho. <laughs> Yukon, Idaho. Yeah, it's, like Yukon. It's, it's like Ryrie, Rigby, yeah, I, remote near Idaho, Rigby. near Idaho Falls, between Idaho Falls and Rexburg. So southeastern Idaho, <laughs> oh BYU-Idaho area. And so again, interesting. It's a little bit like Zion. Well, they referred to it as Zion. I was waiting for you to say that. Preparedness, yes. Zion. He yes. referred to it he as Zion. He referred to Rigby as this is Zion, and this is where God needs us to be. So we are moving everything, and we're going to go live here. And... It was not well received by the family, but that was what he decided to do. Mm. And again, I am not the expert on exact places. And also there is there are so many dreams and visions and they all have their own varying details. So I don't know exactly. But this he, Aval founder guy named Roger K. Roger Young. Young. Roger K. Young. He, 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 he did have visions that he published. And so he's selling books. He's on the financial yes. take. Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh -huh. They are all profiting off of all authors. Fear mongering. Your father's also an author. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And you you mentioned Young Why? I what was that? Roger Young is that what you said? Roger K Young. Why did oh you had asked where we oh. thought that might take place? Okay, in the Rigby area. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, so you moved. Y'all moved from mm -hmm. Colorado yeah. and Arizona mm -hmm. to Idaho. Yep. And can you talk about like Idaho culture, Mormon <sighs> prepper, Idaho culture? And just to bring it back to your story, how mm -hmm. old were you? When when we moved uh -huh. to Idaho, it would have been right after my freshman year. So during my freshman year was really when he got involved in the Avow community and he moved up by himself to Rigby. My family. He was, left your family to go move to Rigby? Yes, because he started working with Roger Young. They started some business that they thought would kind of be a get rich quick scheme, getting people out of debt. Um, so they became business partners in that sense. And my family, my mom and my siblings, we all stayed in Arizona to finish out the school year. My mother was teaching. She did not want to move to Rigby, Idaho at all. She was very opposed to it. That was a huge source of contention between my parents. I really thought that they were going to get a divorce during that time because my father really leaned heavily into that prepping community. Where, where in Arizona? I'm sorry. We were living in Lake Havasu City. Okay. It's near California. Oh, okay. Yeah, a resort just, town. Mm -hmm. I think also part of this too is from Colorado to Arizona to Idaho, mm -hmm. there were multiple failed businesses. Mm -hmm. Your dad is a serial entrepreneur uh. and he kept trying to 
make something work. Make it rich. And I think after that last failure, they Idaho was the next thing, right? Got and it. so that's why there was some moves because Mm-hmm. Yeah, and your mom really held it together as a teacher with insurance. Mm-hmm. I think that's important too. Definitely. So, she was yeah. always. Oh, so your mom was financially keeping the family afloat while your dad mm-hmm. was your visionary dad yes. to, to quote the book of Mormon was pursuing all this Mormon prepper stuff mm-hmm. and having failed businesses along the yep. way. Definitely. Mm-hmm. And it and reminds me of Joseph Smith a little bit. I'm not going to oh, lie. And, yes. and the Smith family. And his, right? his mother was also financially helping us as well. Grandma. Which your dad's mom or your mom's mom? My dad's mom. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, she was always helping us out because there was just never quite enough when he was doing his own businesses. Um, there was a lot of financial struggles. Do you want to get to anything in? Mar- in- Mark, you had a quick question. Oh, yeah. I was just going to, just to bring it back to you for a minute. So growing up in this kind of state of survival, mm-hmm. it just feels like there's, you know, you're in a constant place of fear and kind of a lot of cortisol as like a growing, developing human. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about if that impacted your identity formation? Like I'm just thinking like a lot of childhoods, there's like, I don't know, you have hobbies or (laughs) classes or you're on leagues or, and maybe you did have that. Um, but I'm just curious with your own self-development, how did being in this place of just sort of very, um, almost hypervigilance to everything around you, how did that affect you, your identity formation during those years? That's a great question. It's interesting because I did have some very normal things growing up. Like I was involved in sports and I did cheerleading and gymnastics and, a lot of those things I credit my mother with because she would kind of bring us back down to like a normal baseline. Um, but then at the same time, I was struggling with these fears and anxieties of like, does this all matter? Like, why am I doing these things? If we're preparing for the end of times, like why even go to school? Why yeah. be on a cheerleading squad? Why? It was really a struggle for my brain to understand how do you live in the real world and also how do you prepare for what's coming? Because everything in the real world just seems so meaningless when you're preparing for what's coming. Mm. And so I definitely struggled with that. And it sounds like you were saying your parents almost got divorced. So it sounds like your mom didn't have full buy-in to your dad's beliefs and activities. No, it was a, a, very much a patriarchal relationship where he was in charge of all of the decisions and she was expected to go along with whatever he decided was best for our family. And my father also has dreams and visions. And so in our family, it was expected that he knew better than she knew and that we should always listen to what he I don't know what he was being inspired to do or think. Mm. Okay. Okay. So you move from kind of Western Arizona Mm -hmm. to Rigby, Idaho. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Talk about Idaho, rural Idaho Mormon prepper culture. (laughs) If you you both kind of rolled your eyes and shook your heads when I mentioned that. Yeah. Is it a different thing? I can definitely say that I witnessed my father getting more extreme in his beliefs as we moved to Idaho, there was definitely a shift. So I would say my life before we lived in Idaho, he was very strict, very authoritarian and believed in prepping, but nowhere to the extent that he did once we moved to Idaho, that was like, I almost see it as like these different sections of my life. And I have OCD a lot of times OCD is genetic. I would think that maybe he has similar thought patterns that I do just based on um, some of the things that he said. I would say it seems like that really got a lot worse as he got into this avowal website more heavily and started working with Roger. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the move to Idaho was 
was rough. I, I think it put a lot of strain on my parents' relationship because my mother didn't fully buy into all of the things that he was into. That put a lot of stress on their marriage. It also put a lot of stress on how they were parenting us because they were not a united front on all of the things that they believed. And that was difficult. And, and Idaho, Rigby, Idaho is a very small town. How close is it to Rexburg? 15 minutes. Okay, so this really close. is Rexburg. It is Rexburg, yeah. Area. Yeah. And for those who don't know, there's there's uh, two main BYUs, Brigham Young Universities in, in Mormonism. One's in Provo, that's the main one, which is also very intense. But I think about, so, so BYU Idaho is in Rexburg, mm -hmm. and I jokingly referred, and this may be perceived mm. as disrespectful. And sensitive, Let's particularly just, I'll just right say now. It this way. <laughs> I'll just say Rexburg, Idaho is like ultra conservative Mormonism. That's right. Like yes. if you think Mormonism is conservative, Rexburg takes it next level. True? It really does. It's interesting because they are both run by the same institution, BYU and BYU, Idaho. And yet BYU, Idaho subscribes to what feels like the idea of a higher law. They have more rules than BYU does. It is much more conservative. I mean, we definitely experience that. In terms Even of modesty, clothes. In modesty, clothing, grooming, behavior, it's definitely stricter. To the point that my parents didn't necessarily want me to go to BYU Provo because it was too liberal. The liberal school. <laughs> and BYU being liberal yeah, is laughable, BYU. but that's what they, or dad would say, the liberals <laughs> yeah, at BYU. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And when you say your dad got more intense... Can you just, is there anything that comes to mind in terms of how his behavior changed moving to Rigby, Idaho? Mm -hmm. Or is it hard to remember? I would say he was stricter around specific things like the way I was dressing, like my modesty and the friends that I had and who we associated with. He was How, just so the so folks know what you mean by dressing. Oh, what were the big things that he emphasized in the no nos and the mm -hmm. okays? Because I don't imagine you were wanting to necessarily in Mormon standards dress super immodestly. Yeah, I was never immodest by any means, um, but it was there was more of a focus on what I was wearing and if it was modest and. So, which types of. Things. So like, I remember, and I don't know that necessarily it was, sometimes it's hard to separate. Were these my thoughts specifically mm. on my own? Were these his thoughts or ideas that he shared with me that influenced my thoughts? So I remember when we moved to Idaho, we had, when we lived in Arizona, it was kind of like a beach culture sort of a feel. Like we lived right near California. So it was just kind of laid back. And then we move to Idaho where it's very cold and people are a little bit more uptight sort of a feeling. I remember at one point um, after church going home and getting rid of all of the clothing that I wouldn't be able to wear garments under as a teenager. And for those mm -hmm. who don't even know what garments are, like what body parts are, are yeah. of concern? So for a female wearing garments, you would have to about here on your shoulder covered. So like, like a little undershirt. And so no bare shoulders around, ever. Yeah. So no bare shoulders, no tank tops. And even like a cap sleeve shirt would still need to be fairly modest because you're going to need to cover mm -hmm. most of your armpit as well. And then your garment would, your garment bottom would go from like just above your belly button to just above your kneecap if Which, you were wearing them properly. So for shorts and for skirts, it meant what? It meant wearing things that about touched the top of your kneecap. As the longest. As uh, well as your shortest. That's the shortest. Sorry, that's yeah. the shortest. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. shortest. Most you, yeah. Okay. I even yeah. say below the knee too, right? I, yeah. I think below the knee was always kind of the standard. Because yes, you wouldn't want to push it, you know, yeah. to that point, well, right? You wouldn't want to tempt someone's thoughts by showing too much of your knee cap. So, so. what? Yeah. What were you taught about why it was important to dress modestly, mm -hmm. especially relative to young men? Yeah, I was taught that I had control over the men's thoughts around me. And if I chose to wear something that was immodest, I was literally walking pornography for men around me. So those men did not have full ownership of their thoughts. I was in charge of their thoughts. And mm -hmm. if I provoked them, like that was a sin on me. 
that I was accountable for. So I needed to act in a way, my behavior needed to act in a way that wouldn't make their thoughts be immoral. And my dress needed to also look a certain way that And as a young Mormon woman who experienced scrupulosity or religious OCD, how was that for you? That was difficult for me. I would take things a step further than they needed to go. I remember even fighting with my mother a little bit about this because she was not quite as intense about modesty as I was. And I remember her being like, Kim, do you really need to wear that undershirt under that top? And I'd be like, well, of course, I need to wear this undershirt that's this big under this other top because I need to cover my body. And, you know, I, there was also this feeling of just being unsafe in your body. And mm -hmm. if it was covered, you were safer. Like, mm -hmm. I remember just wearing multiple layers because it felt like my body isn't safe. And I know we spoke earlier before this podcast, I, there was sexual abuse in my childhood. Um, and I think one of my coping mechanisms for making myself feel safe was to cover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, wearing layers and being more modest. And then as we got married and um, I got older, I got even more modest. I had even more rules around what I could wear. Like it was like no kneecaps are showing. That's I started to have, which again goes back to this OCD scrupulosity viewpoint of living this higher law. Like if the law for the general public within yes. Mormonism is only wear something to the knee, to the knee. Well, how can I be more safe and how can I be more righteous mm -hmm. to secure my place in the call out, to secure my place in heaven? Like what can I do to be more righteous yeah. and create safety and security for myself? Mm. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Hmm. Okay, so uh, so what? How did Rigby Life end up being? Now, I should say you were a freshman when you moved to Rigby. The end of my freshman year, we moved to Rigby. So I started my oh, sophomore year. And around year. what year was that? So that would have been two thousand seven. Mm -hmm. Two thousand yeah. Two thousand six. Two thousand six. Yeah. Okay. 14, 15, yeah. So that's another six years before Visions of Glory comes mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. So this is still relatively, this is sort of pre heavy Mormon internet prepper community. But I would even say that before Visions of Glory was published, there were still other books that were similar to that. Any, any mm -hmm. names that, come to mind? So, so Roger K. Young, we spoke about him earlier. He had published a variety of different books and pamphlets and um, Chad Daybell had also published books. I don't know exactly what year Chad first published books. And I would also say oh, like... Oh, that's right. Chad Daybell's books. Yeah. I would also say just because someone had publicly published a book in a specific year doesn't mean that they had not shared their vision or their story online in one of these prepper communities. Or they also, a lot of them would go and speak at different events. Yeah. So those ideas were circulating long before Visions of Glory was ever publicly published. Yeah. yeah. Does the name Avram Gileadi mean anything to you at all? I don't recognize it. I don't think. Okay. We, d we talked about him in a recent episode, the September 6th, these mm -hmm. six scholars that were excommunicated. Avram Gileadi was the one ultra conservative kind mm -hmm. of fundamentalist one. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book about Isaiah in the end times, was excommunicated, but Neil A. Maxwell mm -hmm. got him rebaptized within a year of his excommunication. Mm -hmm. But he signs, he, he puts a blurb on the back oh. of Visions of Glory. Mm -hmm. So he was an early end times prepper kind of, let's just say inspirational grandfather, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like uh, Chad Daybell's books mm -hmm. were Julie, influential. Julie Rowe, Julie Didn't Rowe, grow up had, with Julie Rowe had books as well. I also remember Sarah Manet. She had a, what do they call it? Near death experience that she published a book about. And that one was one that mm -hmm. my father sold in his bookstore as well. Um, there was a, a, definitely a variety of authors that were publishing their near death experiences, their visions and their dreams of what the end of times would look like. So it was not just visions of glory. Okay. 
I'm curious if we were to then drop into your high school years and just kind of let's just say we could do your private kind of home self, but also like at high school, if we were just kind of drop into who you were, what like what would we see in mm. those years? So throughout high school, I did choir, I did theater. I loved my extracurricular activities. What yeah. else did I do? Um, I was always in like the advanced classes. There was a lot of pressure to be a top performer mm-hmm. in our family and to be intelligent and to push ourselves. So lots of, lots of um, excellence. Yes. <laughs> going on. Yes. And I started taking college courses, I think my sophomore or junior year. So that by the time I had graduated, I had a little bit more than a full semester of college done. So what else did I do? You're very overscheduled, just the typical, like, (laughs) kind of overachieving. Overachiever, every single season has two or three activities at the same time. Yeah, so Um, busy. And also, like, just busy, busy, busy. And Mm -hmm. I actually met Kim her senior year of high school. How about that? So that's, I have a little insight to what that was like for her because she was just in every play. She was in every choir. She was mm-hmm. in just and, – and, and then also the grades were very important, perfect grades. Everything was about perfectionism, right? Everything. Was, really a, a huge theme of perfectionism throughout my entire life. Like I didn't feel like there was any room for error. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. error mm-hmm. in my mind could lead to hell or damnation. Like any error could lead me off yeah. of the straight and narrow. So it – needed to be as good as possible. And that's not to say that I was perfect. I definitely had my shortcomings and things that I struggled with, but there was always an attempt at perfectionism. And earlier you kind of talked about your, your childhood years feeling like when you were in your home, it was really difficult to feel safety at home and then finding it kind of in nature and being a little bit more outside your home. Was that true in high school too? And with all those activities and things, this it's also kind of a strategy. It keeps you, or distraction, it keeps you kind of out of the home. Mm-hmm. But was that feeling still present for you in your high school years too? Or how that's, would you talk about that? No, that's a really interesting question because so much changed for me when we moved to Idaho. My relationship with my mother had always been very distant and rocky until we moved to Idaho. And I think because she was struggling with my father and the intensity of his beliefs that she latched more onto me and our relationship. And there was definitely a lot of triangulation within our family. So Uh, for someone who doesn't, isn't familiar with that idea, it's the idea of when one or both parents brings a child into adult problems. So Mm -hmm. This for me looked like if my mom had a disagreement with my father, she would come to me and tell me everything she was feeling, tell me her anger, tell me her sadness, cry. And I was expected to comfort and console her for whatever was going on within her marriage. It also meant things that were not necessarily appropriate for a child were shared with me a lot of times. And I was expected to be able to act as a therapist for her. That was many times what my family expected me to do for all of them. And I was very much the peacemaker in my home. And I prided myself on always being able to comfort people and help them emotionally regulate. The people pleaser older daughter who not only helped comfort mom in all of the marriage issues, but also took care of your siblings. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of parentification where you took care of them as the older sister, the older sibling. Mm-hmm. And doing things as a parent. And yeah, I think I got that wrong. I used the word triangulation, but I meant parentify. Oh. There was parentification. Sorry. You're okay. Um, I'm, I'm guessing both apply. I know. Because well, actually yeah. triangulation Honestly, is yeah. being yes. brought into, you know, in between a, a disagreement between two people. Definitely. And when you're brought into the dynamic. It's both. Yeah. Especially mm-hmm. if you felt any desire or obligation to maybe try and communicate with your dad yeah, as an advocate mom. for your mom, yes. mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that put a lot of stress on my relationship with my father because I was seeing all of these negative views that my mother had about mm-hmm. him and she would come and confide in me whenever they had an issue. And then I would hold on to that anger because 
I have this justice complex <laughs> that we've talked about um, where I want to make things right and everything has to be fair and I want everyone to feel safe and protected. And so I would hold on to a lot of emotions for her. And then she at some point would make up with him, but would never tell me that they had made up or that they had apologized to each other. So I just kept all of this anger mm -hmm. that I harbored for her. Like I need to keep her safe. And yeah, and that's hard as a child to be dealing with those feelings. Um, but yeah, definite parentification going on because they were struggling to stay united as, as the adults. And okay. I mean, looking family. at all that you're holding as a teen, your parents' relationship and some triangulation there, mm -hmm. then also helping out, it sounds like, with your siblings and mm -hmm. some parentification there yep. where you're holding more responsibility likely than your age, you know, yes. and then the overachieving side of trying to do all the things and do all the things brilliantly and with great excellence. Yeah, that's just, did you have a sense of, did it feel like a lot, I guess, is my question. Did it, were you exhausted? Were you so wired mm -hmm. for what was being asked? Like, what is, mm -hmm. was your, if you can go back and remember, how did it feel to have to hold all that? You spoke earlier about my cortisol must have been really high. And I think it really was. I was always on alert. I was always ready to act and to help and to serve and to meet anyone's needs in the family. And I prided myself on that. And I, and I truly loved helping people, and I still do. Um, it wasn't done in a healthy way necessarily. But I think when that's the way that you're raised, that just is your baseline. Your baseline is I'm always over committing. I'm always overextending. And so that's just what I'm used to feeling. Mm -hmm. And I would get sick a lot. I have dealt with a lot of health problems throughout my lifetime. And so I think that was one of my body's ways of dealing yes. with the stress of being everything for everyone and emotionally being there for so many people. So my body would just shut down. I would have these terrible migraines that started around the time that we moved to Rigby. And so interesting. One of the ways I, when I was in therapy, this, I've had a few therapists since we've left the church. And one of them pointed out how it seems as though my struggles with my health, it was really a way for my body to cope with the stress and the trauma that I was enduring. Mm -hmm. And if it shut my body down completely to the point where I couldn't get out of bed, then I didn't have to serve everyone and I didn't have to take care of everyone. And it could give me this like moment to rest from performing and from being everything. It, yeah. And you, and you were in this state for so many years, I think only until after leaving the church, did you get to see some peace and say, this is actually a homeostasis for me. Yeah. All those years of people pleasing, including mm -hmm. as a young mother of, mm -hmm. in the church, but you kind of got to look back and say, wow, I was just overscheduled, overcommitted, and I had I would break down to be sick in order to, to heal and mm -hmm. rest. That's right. It's like forced, yeah. your body forced you. But I think there's very common throughout Mormonism is this theme of conditional love. And so many of us are seeking that conditional love, mm -hmm. and we do it through being high achievers. And whether that be education or whether that be at church, there's just, it feels like you're always looking for that next high and that next victory and the next award. And what am I going to do to earn that love and that praise? Because it doesn't come freely, especially when you have a large family. I think it's really difficult for parents to emotionally meet all of the needs of their children. So you have all of these children who are competing for attention and for love. And it can be so painful for children mm -hmm. to not feel like they deserve unconditional love. There's this theme of always needing to compete. Absolutely. To best. earn it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so is it like, let's just say we want to go up to the point of high school mm -hmm. and then maybe check in, um, 
with with Josh just a little bit about his upbringing. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Your high school experience, your your testimony, your experiences at church, and your experiences with your parents and and mm-hmm. all this Idaho Mormon neo fundamentalist prepperism stuff. Is there anything you can think of? I mean, there's so many things to say, but. <laughs> Um, like once you, I'll just say this, once you moved to Idaho, is your dad attending conferences? Is he meeting strange people? Is he becoming a leader? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What are you noticing in terms of his activities related to prepperism and or the prepper mm-hmm. community? Definitely becoming a leader, meeting with new people, creating this community for himself where he was revered and respected. Something that Josh and I have spoken about was that he really didn't progress within Mormonism as quickly as many other men did. Oh, he wow. wasn't getting these important callings. He, I mean, even at age, his late fifties, he was still not um, a high priest. A yeah. high priest. Yeah. And so he went and he created this own world for himself where he was revered and praised and he had this information that no one else had and people needed to come to him. And I thought it was so interesting. Like, okay, we go to church and you don't have any high callings per se. Um, but then you have this own community you've created where you are revered. And it feels very egocentric that it's like this, this juxtaposition to have these two different worlds that he resides in. But when... If it was ever questioned, it was like, oh, well, mainstream Mormonism, they don't know what I know. And one day, one day it's going to all work out and it'll be fair and everyone will realize I knew all these things and I should have been respected by them. So it was interesting to see that, those two different worlds, right? Yeah. Where he was kind of made fun of at church, really, within our ward. A lot of times was made fun of for his extremist beliefs or he would get in trouble with Salt Lake City. We would get letters that... The things he was spreading were too intense or his ideology was not in alignment with with the prophet, really. Yeah. Okay, Remember? can I ask about that? Yeah. Yeah, so obviously we're not trying to claim that this is mainstream Mormonism, mm-hmm. but it's very it's a very large movement mm-hmm. in especially Utah, Idaho, Arizona Mormonism. Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's hard to thread that needle. Um but I, I was going to ask about, like, did, were, were your bishops into this? Were your other ward members? Did the church, how, in what ways did the Mormon, mainstream Mormon corporate church show concern about your dad in those high school years? Was church discipline ever on the table that you know of? Or was it like X percent of your ward was really into this stuff and it was just a sizable minority in your ward or was it the majority in your ward? I'm curious about how that worked. I would say a little bit of everything that you said. There were some people who really believed everything that he was teaching and thought it was great and incredible and that he had this further insight and knowledge that no one else had. And then there were certain bishops who did not like what, what he was doing also, I feel like he also came into some success, right? So he had the f- multiple failed businesses. And then in Rigby, through this forum, AVAL, a membership forum. So lots of memberships, lots of enrollments. Mm. Really, they bought the big the big house in the well, neighborhood. It really wasn't so successful financially, though. A lot of people think it was really successful because he lives in a really large home. And he didn't purchase that home. Your grandma. He moved us into a tiny two-bedroom, mold-infested apartment claimed that he was making grundles of money and that we were going to be wild, wildly successful. My grandmother saw where we were living, and about at this time, I, my health problems really started um, to have an uptick. Because you're living in a moldy apartment? In yes. Rigby, yes. Uh-huh. She came and she saw where we were living, and she cried. She was like, how could you do this to your family? How are you letting them live in these conditions? She went and she purchased a three-story beautiful home and said, this is going to be my vacation home, but why don't you move your family into this home until you find your own place to move, until you get on your feet with your business. So, so this is your dad's to- mom again. Yes, Grandma mm-hmm. Margot. Mm-hmm. And remind me, you said that they joined the church. So no, his his father had joined the oh. church with his new wife, but his mother oh. did not join the church. 
So no, she was not a so she she, was it, man. Was she concerned about? I know that was very my, very concerned, son? very Always. concerned. Even like when he joined the church, she sent him pages and pages of what he called anti Mormon rhetoric, trying to let him know that it was a cult and that he shouldn't be joining this. And he laughed at his mother. And I mean, this was her only child. And she stood outside of the temple on his wedding day. Like, oh, so the pain that she went through, like to see him leaving everything that she had raised him with and joining this church. And then she stands outside the temple on his wedding day. Like, I just can't imagine the pain of a single mother with your only child not being in there on your wedding day. She was really good to us. She always really cared a lot about you. And I think even witnessing, though, this this next level belief system and you living, like making active, his, her son making active choices mm-hmm. where you're experiencing harm, yeah. you know, that would just be heartbreaking. I'm taking it she's no longer alive? No, she passed away. Hmm. And do you have a sense for how she made her... F- I don't want to say fortune, but... Oh, her new husband, um, he had a boat company. Lake Havasu City. it was very successful. Lots of boats in Lake Havasu City. Mm -hmm. She also was a big smoker and drinker. And one of the things I hated the most was that your dad would judge her so harshly Mm -hmm. for that, even Uh, though she financially uh, supported him. mm -hmm. For years. years, For years and paid for so many things. Paid for so many things because she loved her grandkids. Mm -hmm. But he would, you know, mock her lack of belief in what he believes and... Well, and and again, that idea I shared with you where the evil spirits enter your body, if you take, if you consume alcohol or if you have any substances, he would always bring it back to her. Like, look at her. She's this sick person who's addicted to drugs or not drugs, but cigarettes and alcohol. And she allows these evil spirits to come into her body. Like no one be like her. And she did have her shortcomings and things that she struggled with. But she also was always there financially to support him. And there was never any accountability Mm. on his side Mm. that he wasn't making enough to provide for his family. Mm. That's hard. Okay. So she she was feeling like her son's getting swept up in a cult, basically. (laughs) Yes, she was very concerned. Yeah. Rightfully so. And so was she close to her grandkids through her... Yeah, so the four of us, um, when we lived in Arizona, she played a more active role in our family. Because you were close to her, physically. I was not, physically. yes, physically close. Yeah. Um, she was very close with my twin brother. I was not super mm-hmm. close with her growing up. Um, we didn't become close until probably after I had had kids is when we started. When we got married. Yeah, once we got married. She yeah. adored Josh, so. <laughs> <laughs> she did a lot for us in our early years of marriage. She's very kind to us. Mm. Um, mm. But what were we? Well, was, so, at high school, I was trying to say that your school. dad was so respected in that neighborhood because it was the big house. Yes. yes. And so his ward was very much like, you know, he has all the money. He has this mm-hmm. forum. He has these online. Like, they resonated with that. Mm-hmm. They were also very impressed by him. Mm-hmm. Right. He was the one that donated money. He was the mm-hmm. one that – and he had the flexibility to do so mm-hmm. because the house was – Because he had no mortgage. Right. Right. That's That's helpful. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So the business was thriving, and he loved that image of that. Yeah. This is my house, and he didn't tell anyone that grandma did that. And but then the mm-hmm. ward revered him mm-hmm. as, and then he got into scouting a lot too. So mm-hmm. during your high school years, he was in that too. But I mean, I guess we were also exploring, and this is a common theme. Uh, Lauren said, and I think someone may have said this to Lauren um, Matthias that mm-hmm. that um, if if Chad Daybell had just been called as a bishop. Mm-hmm you know, his wife and, and Lori's kids may not be dead right now. Mm. That if this Tom Harrison guy, I guess he was called as a bishop. We'll, you know, we, we will have, we'll probably air this after we talk about him, but it seems like a lot of this prepper movement is fueled by semi disenfranchised Mormons who are conservative, but aren't getting through whether it's lack of connections or family members or cronyism or money, they're less educated, more rural, and more disen- less enfranchised, less empowered. And so this, this prepperism can be a way to gain mm-hmm. power through and ye- near-death experiences, claims of special powers, mm-hmm. 
and or through hyper conservatism or community building or book publishing. Yeah. And I would even say a lot of people who are in this group are highly educated. It isn't just, I think sometimes people associate those in a cult as being less intelligent or maybe being poor. And a lot of them are well off and well educated and you would think have great reasoning skills and critical thinking skills. And yet the research that I've done suggests that a lot of very highly educated people become victims of cults. And yeah. that's so interesting. Like Dr. Stephen Hassan. Hassan, he talks a lot about that, how so many of the people within Mormonism are highly educated. They're very intelligent and some of them are very well off. And yet because we are so trusting, we can sometimes not question things and conditioned to yeah. sort of fall in, fall into the patriarchal can, line of things. And this is how it's always mm-hmm. been. Men have always been in charge. They have the authority. When we just believe what we're told, we don't necessarily question. So some of the people in that group are, I've been surprised to learn how much education they have okay, and how well read they are. It's like no shortage of reading and researching and, and yet that f- seems to further their belief system. Like I am so intelligent and this is what I believe. Yeah. And I've done all the work to back it up. Yeah. Jonathan Haidt reminds us that sometimes being educated or intelligent mm-hmm. provides you with more ability to rationalize and to employ confirmation bias. Yes. Definitely. Makes you better at that. Mm. So uh so do you have you'd be speculating, but do you have any idea why your dad wasn't called as a bishop or stake president or bishopric member or stake presidency member? I, I, I wouldn't expect you would know, but if he was highly respected, looked like he was wealthy and affluent. Yeah. And I wouldn't say he was highly respected within our wards. It was certain people who also believed in prepping. He okay. was highly respected amongst those specific Got it. people. It's like in his created community. Yes. Yes. In the yes. world that, that he has created exactly. for himself, very highly respected. In mainstream Mormonism, people are questioning why he's being so intense, why he has these fringy beliefs. So I would say definitely the respect was not within our ward as a whole. It was the people who believed in that, those ideas. And this is a theme I'm going to, my, my viewers and listeners are just going to need to be patient about, but as someone who, you know, ha, has been associated more with the left of Mormonism, of progressive Mormonism, of liberal Mormonism, um, you know, the church has been watching our people for decades, for half a century or more, like a duck on a June bug, as they say, excommunicating us, hounding us, terrorizing us in some ways. Um, But it seems like the church has just decided for so long to give the right fringe a pass. And, And for some reason, people like your dad, the church would let alone, even though in some ways his and others' beliefs might be more heretical, more fringe, and I would argue certainly more damaging to people's lives within the church. I mean, deadly, really. Yeah. We have seen that happen, and it's very concerning. Mormonism fosters a culture where the Mm -hmm. right-wing rhetoric, the right-wing conspiracy theories— can just thrive, and there seems to be very little punishment for it. Um, there was a there's a a conference your dad used to go to called the Expo Firm, where the speakers would be like Chad Daybell, Tim Ballard, Roger K. Young, your Rod dad Mel- Rodney Meldrum. Yeah, Rod- Meldrum was another name that I saw in some of those old sort of flyers for those kind of, and that's those are the types of people speaking, the ones with visions, ones with, and, and Tim Ballard is part of that, and the church has finally mm-hmm. spoken out about some of that, but it is behind on going after the right. It's always been going after the left. So I thought the right yeah. and Mormonism were synonymous my mm-hmm. whole life. Like you were supposed to be, mm-hmm. a, my, yeah. my grandpa was, you can't be a Democrat and a Mormon, mm-hmm. right? Oh, that was kind of how I was, I was raised, mm-hmm. so. Yeah, okay. Okay, so through your senior year of high school, uh, Kim, and your maiden name was Parrot, mm-hmm. is that right? Parrot. Parrot, Parrot. Mm-hmm. okay. Um, you your dad was just becoming more and more prepper famous. Mm -hmm. And, and was that causing more and more stress between your parents? 
was was he becoming even more strict by the time you're a senior w- w- where are things w- with your family with family health your mental health and happiness yes yeah, so he was more strict but also i would say he felt very distant at was times he gone a lot? too he was physically present emotionally very checked out because mm. all that really mattered was his online businesses. And Aval was not the only thing that he was running. He was he also has another forum that he runs for Snowmobiling. snowmobiling. So he was just working nonstop. And I think like as we've done therapy and as we've left the church, we've realized there's a lot of dissociation in our family. And I think a lot of times people imagine that dissociation looks a certain way. Like it looks like laying on the couch and scrolling on your phone. And yet dissociation can be feel like you have a motor inside of you running and you just go, 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 almost like a machine. And I would say that he was highly dissociated and his dissociation was working and just nonstop. What can I do? What can I do? How can I be on my computer? How can I be making more money? And I, I think there's a lot of fear there too, always feeling the need to come up with the next big idea to make ends meet. Mm-hmm. But definitely very dissociated throughout those high school years. Okay. I have a question with regard to you, in particularly in the years where you might date, you might have the option of dating, and you um, shared with us about your sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. If if you were going to kind of talk about um, the different ways that impacted you. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe you spoke about it a little bit with regard to perfectionism, there being a bit of a tie there. Mm-hmm. But do you want to do you want to take that on at all and talk about mm. if the impact on you during those years in particular, mm-hmm. thoughts you had or behaviors or the way you kind of coped? Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's a good one. Um, So I started dating before I turned 16, which was an issue within my family. My mother at the time was fine with that, and my father was very much not okay with it. And That's a huge no-no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it it was so hard because I had explained earlier, my father's living in one state and my mother's living in another state, and they are not aligned at all with their religious beliefs. So she's pushing really this narrative of like, go and do whatever you want to do. And he's really pushing this idea of purity and virtue. And I'm living with her. So I'm like, well, I guess I will date. And at the same time, I'm just this love-starved child, Mm -hmm. this love-starved teenager who doesn't have unconditional love and is always looking for the next person that can provide me with that feeling of safety. And so I think I turned a lot to dating as a way to feel fulfilled and as a way to get those emotional needs met. met. That makes so much sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a great question. So that caused tension with your parents? Mm-hmm, definitely. And had, was that significant for you or, you know? Yeah, it, it was very difficult, like being the child in that and not knowing necessarily what I should do. Like, how do I solve this conflict between them? Because I hated their being any conflict at all in our home. Conflict is of the devil is what I was taught. And so it was like, how do I fix this? But also how do I, I mean, I am a dissociator as well. And so I think it's like all about avoiding those painful emotions that you're dealing with. So getting out of the house is like this way that you avoid those painful emotions. (laughs) It's Mm -hmm. like, go find your friends and hang out with them or go find a boy who cares about you because that'll make you feel better. Um, there's a lot a lot of that. So I, I did date a lot. And there were a lot of disagreements between my parents. <laughs> so we we often cover Mormon shame as, as a way the church gains power and control mm-hmm. over people. Mm-hmm. Is there anything you want to share about Mormon shame, bishops, you know, up through your senior year of high school. Or even your own, like your own view of your worthiness or Mm -hmm. not. Yeah. So I always struggled with feelings of worthiness because like we mentioned earlier, 
there was sexual abuse throughout my childhood. There were by multiple people. Um, this is one of those hard ones. Mm, yeah. When you have OCD and intrusive thoughts, it can be so painful to feel shame because it's just like you're stuck in this revolving cycle of shame and these intrusive thoughts just keep coming like over and over and it can be so painful. So some of the abuse that happened happened before I turned eight and then it also continued after I was eight. Um, and so after I was eight and I was accountable for everything that was going on, I had just this like impending doom feeling that I'm going to go to hell because I am now accountable and this person must be abusing me because I've done something to warrant that or to make them feel like they should be doing that. And I want to explain these things without giving too much detail and still protecting myself, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. When the people that you expect to keep you safe do not keep you safe, it can be very difficult. And so I didn't always know what was normal and what was abuse. It was hard for me to tell the difference. And that put me in a lot of situations where I was able to be abused because I was really the perfect victim. I was very shy I was very scared. I did not ever stand up for myself. And that creates a great abuse victim. I had no understanding of sexuality. We didn't talk about body parts. We just spoke about if you are dressed immodestly, you are pornography, you are... Sorry. You are accountable for what their thoughts are about you. And so all throughout my childhood, I just had this terrible feeling like I will not be with my family in heaven. Mm. And I think maybe that's part of, you asked when did my OCD really peak? And I think it was around the time I got baptized because it was like, well, if I can't be with my family, I'm at least going to do everything right that I can to cover up or to try to offset the scale and balance it out a little bit because of this abuse that's happened because of, and I didn't know it was abuse at the time. So I wasn't framing it as like, this thing has happened to me and I'm not accountable or I'm not, it's not my fault. It was like, no, this thing happened to me and I fully have to own it. And it's my fault that it happened. Yeah. Um, and I really think, the OCD was a result of the abuse. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard as an adult going back and looking at that little child. Mm -hmm. You know, having little girls of my own. <laughs> and wanting to keep them safe and protect them from what happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I grew up in a home where victims were always doubted. You know, if my parents heard of a case of abuse, it was always, what did she do to deserve that? And so I stayed quiet. I never told a soul mm. to the point that I didn't even tell my husband about it until about two years ago. Because oh. I had so much shame. I thought he might make it to heaven. I won't make it to heaven, but I'll at least do everything in my power to get my kids there. Make sure my husband gets there, but I might not be there with you in the highest, in the highest glory, at least. Mm -hmm. But I'll try. Mm -hmm. 
I'm sorry. We're so, so sorry. There's just so much to hold for so long. Yeah. And it just seems to be so prevalent in this church. <sighs> the more that we have discussed with other people who have left the church, yeah. the more we have found how prevalent this is. And it's so heartbreaking. Yeah. It really is. There is so much sexual abuse that goes on within the Mormon church that goes unreported. And even if for many women, even when they did go to their bishop or they did tell someone about what was happening, it was just swept under the rug. Or to a lawyer firm, yeah. right. not to an authority, mm -hmm. which Arizona and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Kirk and McConkie. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And then circling back to this topic of kind of shame and worthiness, did that, I imagine it affected your dating and, and your, those high school years where bishops are trolling for your unworthiness, so to speak? Yeah, definitely. Um, If you want to share, I'm not yeah, like no, only I, what you feel like you want to share for your story. Yeah. We, we have no desire to pry, right? No, I, I understand. And we talked about this beforehand. These were <laughs> themes you wanted to talk about. So, sure. Yes, there was a lot of shame and I did date and I did do some things that were not allowed according to Mormonism. And so there were times that I went to the bishop to repent of those things. Um, and I was, um, what was the book that I was given? The terrible book. Miracle of Forgiveness? Miracle of Forgiveness. I spent Star Kimball. Just absolutely heart-wrenching, mm -hmm. terrible book that is no what, longer. What messages from that book, written by a Mormon prophet, Spence W. Kimball, mm -hmm. what were some of the main takeaway messages that you found to be harmful? So it's been years since I've read it. Um, so I don't specifically Even remember vaguely. the themes, but I just remember feeling so filled with with shame. And and there was this idea, gosh, I think it taught about the idea of godly <clears throat> sorrow versus worldly sorrow. And so I was always trying to decide, like, was my sorrow great enough? Was it godly enough sorrow versus worldly sorrow? Am, have I been forgiven? And something that people with scrupulosity struggle with a lot is they want to confess all the time because they always feel like they have sinned in some way or if they have a bad thought, like, I need to go confess. Um, and so I did go confess a lot of times. And sometimes there were not really things I needed to confess. And, and other times, according to Mormonism and those standards, there were. And I remember one of the bishops he told me one time that if you repent of something and then you make that same or a similar mistake, that it undoes all of your previous repenting. Yeah. And I remember that was like so heart wrenching. I was just like, oh, because I remember going in one time and he was like, you need to repent of everything in your whole life, all of these transgressions. And every time I was going in, I was saying like, okay, X, Y, Z has happened in this, with this relationship with this person I'm dating, but really I'm holding the weight of the sexual abuse every time I'm going in. Yeah. But I'm not speaking about it. It's like, yes. I'm going in and I'm repenting and I'm crying and I'm praying and feeling all that shame and guilt. And uh, so much of it was coming from my childhood, knowing that I couldn't, I couldn't say the words out loud. Yes, I the just, unspoken. I just felt like I couldn't get those words out. I tried so many times. Um, I could never get them out. Mm -hmm. I was, I couldn't do it. So when I would repent for other things, it was like I was really just reliving the pain of what had happened as a child. And that was hard, just. 
Yeah, it also seems like that idea of going back in your life and asking for forgiveness for all those, all the things throughout your, that does feel like reinforcement mm -hmm. for scrupulosity as well. Like, Definitely. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Um, really quickly, just to tie in kind of the Jody Hildebrandt side of this and all these Maurice Harker and all these therapists that are now going to prison for abusing their clients when they set themselves up as the cure to sex addiction. Mm -hmm. Like this idea that's just so disturbing in visions of glory, this idea that demons are running around the world trying to penetrate your brain so that they can make you look at porn and mm -hmm or have sex and do evil things combined with the teachings that not just Spencer B. Kimball, but David O. McKay, you know, Heber J. Grant, you know, um, uh, Ezra Tapp Benson, even Gordon B. Hinckley, they, for decades, the Mormon church prophets taught that sexual sin is next to murder in severity. Mm. And I found at least five Mormon prophets that said in one way or another, better dead than unclean. And I found quotes where Mormon prophets say any good Mormon parent would rather their kid be dead than violate, you know, have, have, have premarital sex basically. Mm -hmm. And you, you combine this, um, you know, this, this, uh, pathologization of healthy normative sexual behavior with calling it demonic and next to murder and severity. And then demons are all around you at all times trying to penetrate your brain and make you sin. It just amps it up to this level of intensity, and I would say obsession, where you you are more likely than not going to create more sexual dysfunction than you're ever gonna ever gonna cure. In other words, you create the sexual dysfunction and the sexual acting out or make it far worse than it ever would have been if just normalized and said, hey, try not to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. Try not to, you know, there's risks in sexual activity. There's, you know, porn and masturbation aren't great, you know, and you just kind of left it at that versus the obsession around sex. It seems to be almost farming and cultivating abuse and dysfunction along with the guilt and shame. And I, I wonder if that, and that Jody Hildebrandt had a $3 million home, you know, um, profiteering off of intense sexual shame. Yep. And she was inspired by Tom Harrison mm -hmm. and the book Visions of Glory. Yep. And she was woven into this, and Tim Ballard and all the sexual dysfunction we're seeing there. Like, it just seems like this Mormon neo-fundamentalist prepper community is like, Get, has way more than its share of sexual abuse and dysfunction, even though it appears it presents as being obsessed with with avoiding it and getting rid of it. Well, that's a big, long setup for, is that your experience? Or am I just making all that up in my head? No, I, I think you made some great points. There is so <clears throat> much repression within Mormonism and then even more within that prepper community. And I think it creates a ton of sexual dysfunction. And, and then all of a sudden you get married and you're supposed to have sex <laughs> and when it's not going normally, you're wondering what's wrong. And it's like, well, it's been shamed your whole life. And you've mm -hmm. tied, you've negatively associated all of these things with sex. And all of a sudden it's supposed to be this beautiful power of God that we have. It's like, well, how do you go from everything being so shameful and so terrible and suddenly a light switch just clicks and it's beautiful and it's of God. And how do you make that switch in your brain? And I, so many people in the, in the church are struggling with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's also a taboo topic. It's just not, you're not allowed to talk about sex. Like you don't have yeah. education around it. You don't know what it is. You, you, you just, you're just married and suddenly it's okay. It's like, well, you, you haven't been even discussed it. Like, what is it? How does it work? Like, yeah. Well, what's a, you know, it's all bad. Just don't mm -hmm. talk about it. That's right. And suddenly it's okay. And there's a lot of shame around addiction and the tie to sex, like addiction, like pornography and all these, these programs that they put a lot of men in that just, it just ties mm -hmm. a lot to that community too. You see that quite a bit. So, 
So what did all this Mormon toxic sexual shame, by the time you're graduating, how did it, did, was it, did it impact you in material ways? And if so, how? Definitely. But by the time I was graduating, we were getting engaged and married. So just directly into our relationship mm -hmm. and our marriage. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. As it goes, right? Yeah. Yeah. She was yeah. 18. I was 21. When you got married? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, Josh, I, Margie and I are like texting like, wait a minute, we haven't brought Josh in yet. And <laughs> it's tough because like, you know, I think we're covering really important stuff. So yeah. let's, let's shift and just say, what about your upbringing do you want to share that weaves into this story? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I was... Um, and thank you, Kim, for being willing to share such sensitive stuff. Yeah. Thank Very you. Very brave. Very brave and courageous. Um, so I was, um, I was... My parents went to BYU, both of them. My dad played basketball at Rick's and uh, Rick's College, uh, which is now BYU-Idaho. And my parents met at BYU or at Rick's and then went to BYU together to graduate because at the time BYU... Idaho or Ricks was a two-year college. Um, so I grew up in the church. I'm the oldest of four, um, two younger brothers and a younger sister, uh, born in Utah, raised in Idaho. So um, when I was in kindergarten, I moved to Idaho Falls, Idaho, um, and spent my whole childhood and teen years in Idaho Falls. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very familiar with Rexburg and BYU-Idaho, the university just 30 miles north. Um, and Idaho is definitely had a big impact. The culture of Idaho Mormonism had a big impact on me growing up. Um, I was raised in scouts. I was raised with guns. I was raised with all of the sort of intense conservative beliefs around being, just being in Idaho, right? It's just kind of, it's a, it's a higher law. Salt Lake City was a liberal place that we would visit on weekends to go shopping. Um, but growing up as a kid, I... Um, I was the oldest, so I was all about being the people pleaser. Um, I remember feeling pressure from my mother to bear my testimony at a young age to make her proud because mm -hmm. um, she would beam w with pride if I would go up and bear my testimony. And so <coughs> I, at a young age, uh, would get that conditional love. Um, and so always wanting to please my parents and making sure that they approved of me, um, we grew up in a pretty contentious household, a lot, of, a lot of yelling. I remember specifically my mom yelling and swearing at us to get ready for church, mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of odd to me because, like, we're going to church to, to not swear. And um, so I grew up in, in Idaho Falls. Everyone was Mormon, it felt like. It was really highly, I wouldn't say 70, 80 percent, my whole, my whole neighborhood. I mean, there would be one on a street that was not LDS. So, what was the joke they made? Everyone's Mormon, and if they're not, they're just inactive? Exactly. Yeah, that was my high school. The seminary building was just flowing. It was a lot of Mormons. Um, so, in a sense, I, I grew up in this, um, and I was, it was three brothers. We were all two years apart, and then my sister didn't come until much later. And so, I grew up with boys. And being a boy in the church honestly wasn't a terrible thing. <laughs> I, I, I hate to say it that way, but it's true. I mean, I was, I remember when I became a deacon's quorum president, um, I had authority and power at 12, mm -hmm. right? I had mm -hmm. more than your, more than the grown women, more than my own mother, Yeah, right? Which yeah. is so bizarre, right? Yeah. Or any of the women in the ward. Yeah. And so at 12 years old, I was handed a manual of how to oversee mm. this at a deacon's quorum of 24. Mm. Um, That's big. Big, it big quorum. Big. Uh, in fact, we broke into two groups oftentimes <laughs> into 12 and 12. And as Deacon's wow. Quorum president, you know, but I was always sort of the perfect kid, right? Like always getting that conditional love. I grew up, I, I'm the oldest of 18 grandkids on my mom's side, 18 cousins. And as the oldest, there was a lot of pressure to be the first in everything, to mm -hmm. go first, to do everything first. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of aunts that were very overzealous, um, to put it nicely, and would often tell me, pull me aside, that all of my kids, all nine of my kids are looking up to you. All four of my kids are looking to you. And I just, that was a lot of pressure. So not only from my own mother, but also from this, you know, 18 grandkids on my mom's side of the family. My dad grew up a little bit more 
Jack Mormon. My mom was very, very devout. And so my dad always taught me from a young age, and I'll always be grateful for this, that you can find good in anyone. And so he'd often, I have a, I'd have a few non-Mormon friends, and he would always welcome them regardless of beliefs. Whereas my mother was very, you don't date non-Mormon girls, we don't have non-Mormon friends. So I kind of had that, that, that caused a lot of problems in their marriage where my dad was never righteous enough for my mom. And so she looked to me, there was some parentification there, mm-hmm. to be the future yeah. of the house. If we go back to the Game of Thrones, Lord of the house. Um, but my authority and power, right, as a 12-year-old boy, and I would be what my dad was not, which always always threw me because I loved my dad, and he was a great dad, and I thought he, he was enough, but my mom never did. And so that dynamic was always really hostile as a kid growing up where mm-hmm. m- my dad was never enough. Part of it had to do with the fact that my mom worked. So my parents were both teachers and educators and I think my mom resented working. I mean, she lived in a neighborhood where 99% Mm -hmm. of the women did not work. Very few moms worked, unless they were a single mom or something. So she had to work, and she. I I think there was some resentment there that, why don't you make enough as a teacher so that I don't have to work? And and so he always felt like he had to overcompensate by being a really good dad around the house and helping out with chores, which in turn helped me learn to be— a great man later with domestic uh, labor. <laughs> um, but there was a, sh- a sense of shame. My dad was never, he never made enough. He never mm. was righteous enough. And I was, I was this prized trophy or golden child son that in my mom's eyes, mm. right? Um, there were a lot of narcissistic. You were Nephi a little bit? A little bit. There was a little narcissistic sort of traits of my mother and to me, like I'm this son that will change mm-hmm the family or that I'll be enough. And it also caused resentment between me and my father. I was going to say, yeah. I think he was reminded of, and my mom facilitated that. I think she would put me in his face, like, why can't you do? Because I loved rules. I was a people pleaser. I loved lists. I loved Mm -hmm. even questioning my dad. Dad, why don't you lead family home evening? Why don't we do scripture study? Why aren't you the one that... And he had, you know, he did all the things. He checked all the boxes, but he did the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. And... um, Looking back, I'm actually grateful for having the two experiences. Uh, but at the time, it was hard because I'm just a kid trying to do my best yeah. and be enough for my mom and mm-hmm. make her proud, make my grandfather proud, make all these cousins proud. There was just mm-hmm. so much pressure. My mom's father was very wealthy and had a lot of um, influence on this family of these 18 grandkids. And so there was a lot of talk of careers at age 12. Wow careers and where would you go to school and when would you leave on your mission? So all of my teen years were spent in that. Um, I was also kind of a nerdy kid. I loved, I loved scouts. I loved, um, I loved like Harry Potter and I loved Star Mm -hmm. Wars (laughs) and I loved math. I was a big math fan. And my dad was one of those kind of jock characters. So he played basketball at Rick's and sports were what mattered. And I was kind of a nerdier kid. I still did all the sports, though. I played all the sports. Mm. I did exactly what I was supposed to. Um, but oftentimes was sort of shame for being like the Duty to God Award kid. I got my Eagle Scout at 14. And so that was a big milestone for me. Um, and that was early. We would go to scout camp, and I would pride myself on getting the most merit badges at scout camp of my entire troop. I remember I had a scout master that was like, and Josh had 14 merit badges in five days. And I just remember being exhausted, like trying to not only please my mom, but also these scout masters and kind of being the golden child within that. Um, But there was all this contention at home. So I was always confused with like, we're presenting one way at church. We're always there. We're always pretending that everything's nice. But at home, there was all this yelling and all this contention. And so I was always kind of confused by why are we not the same people at home that we are at church? And there mm-hmm. was the, the need to be a, you know, a perfect sort of member or, or perfect family, that we looked the part, even mm-hmm. though we weren't really the part. Yeah. So that, that was always hard as a, as a kid and as a, as a teen. Yeah, I can imagine. So, mm. um, what else? Other themes. <clears throat> so were you, to what extent was end times millennial prepperism 
a part of your upbringing? Not a lot, but it was in the area. So my parents weren't as political as they were focused on like BYU sports and BYU football and BYU just sports are all that matters, right? And but we lived in a very conservative area, so I had a lot of scout leaders and we'd do a lot of scout camps and there was a lot of conservative sort of pol- – Idaho in general is just conservative. So I didn't really know that that was my baseline mm-hmm. where it's just very conservative. Now, I wasn't anywhere near what Kim's family was. Like, no, I, don't, I don't think you had any experience really with, with preppers. I don't think much. it was until you met me. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of preppers. There was a lot of conservative politics though, yeah. Fox News and just very sort of – um, you know, guns and a lot of jokes about liberals and BYU being liberal and stuff like that. But it was very, Idaho was just very conservative, right? We just all grew up with a shotgun in our hand going to scout camp. So that was just the way of Idaho Falls. Um, and very heavy L- heavy LDS. Like all my friends are LDS. I had very few non-Mormon friends. Almost every girl I dated was LDS. So it was, um, in some ways, I thought it was weird when someone was an LDS. I was like, oh, they're not, they don't go to church? That was just, I just grew up in a bubble where everyone went to church. Mm. So Idol Falls was unique in that way um, for me. Yeah. And did you experience a lot of shame as a Mormon teen, teenage boy? Definitely. Uh, the, all the pressure with the family um, really took its toll. Uh, I, I would see it come out in mental health with cousins. Or I'd have cousins that were severely depressed or a lot yeah. of us had anxiety because We needed to make sure grandpa and these aunts and uncles approved of us. Mm -hmm. And I have these really intense, just this one one uncle and one aunt in particular that just so overbearing, constantly checking in on our accomplishments, right? So the accomplishments were for their sake, Mm -hmm. not for ours. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my cousins don't really understand that. And I still tell them that, you know, it's about how they look, their image. Mm -hmm. And this, as we've studied narcissistic tendencies, it all makes a lot of sense because it's about how do I look? How do my children's accomplishments make me look? Mm-hmm. And me being the oldest of 18 grandkids, all of my accomplishments were under a microscope. So, yes, I had really bad anxiety as a kid. If I did have a failure, it was devastating. If I didn't do good enough in a sport or I didn't mm-hmm. get the top spelling bee or if I didn't – it was just I walked around just as an anxious kid that was so nervous about getting a B+. Plus. Um, you know, A's or nothing sort of mentality. And that, t- that took its toll, um, especially when during those teenage years, you start to, you know, explore and you, and you, you, maybe you saw pornography and you sort of beat yourself up with shame and guilt. And you don't want to reveal a weakness to mm-hmm. anyone in this high performing family. Mm-hmm. You don't want to say that, like, I messed up with a girl or I, I looked at pornography or, I, I watched an R-rated movie secretly or mm-hmm. whatever the rule was. Um, you know, we just weren't allowed to, to have weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, until, to be human, really. Right. Mm-hmm. We're just performative robots. I often think back to like, what accomplishment can I make to make my mom happy? What accomplishment can I do to make sure grandpa gives me that conditional love? Yeah. I just so badly wanted their approval. So praise mm-hmm. for me was like, oh, grandpa, grandpa thought I did a good job. Yeah, and that's amazing. I got my scout camp, or I got my my Eagle Scout, and I'm in front of all my family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're all adoring me, and this is what I live for, right? It's all about accomplishment and performance. So it, it, was, it almost feels like it trains us to be addicted to dopamine. Like hmm. we've talked before about how sometimes it feels like Mormons are like these little mini addicts. Like we're not addicted to drugs or alcohol per se, but we are addicted to the dopamine of people's approval. I think mm. that's a very big theme throughout Mormonism is we see these mothers that need this constant stream of accomplishments and from their children to yeah. prove that the mother has worth and that she's doing a good enough job. And yeah. you saw that a lot within your family. Yeah, there, uh, a lot of ADHD in the family, so a lot of dopamine chasing, accomplishment chasing. I've always had a theory that in high demand religions after all of this studying that there is a narcissistic complex among mothers that's not necessarily their fault because if their only fulfillment in the Mm -hmm. church is through their children, they don't have a lot of fulfillment elsewhere, especially if they're not working or they don't have some sort of hobby that they look to. And that's not the mother's necessarily fault. It's just kind of the system, the patriarchal system is set up where the accomplishments of my children are all that I live for. Mm -hmm. And so when you disappoint them, it's like the most devastating thing in the world to them because you've... 
somehow ruined their reputation. Because it like impacts their identity, right? Mm -hmm. Their sense of self. Because it's a reflection on, it's in their minds, in mm -hmm. Mormon mom's minds, it's a reflection of bad parenting. You know, your, your behavior as a child. Yeah, exactly. It's like a moral shortcoming. If, if the child isn't performing well enough, like what has the mother done wrong or where has she fallen short? Exactly. Which is so unfair and so harmful. Yeah. 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 What I'm hearing and also what you're, you're describing is also this, in some ways, a leaving of yourself mm -hmm. in order to please others in other, in other words, to like, um, to become what is expected to be what people want right. you to be and to have that love. It, it, the connection is outside yourself. You're always looking outside yourself. So it leaves you with like this sense of like an emptiness as to like what actually would make you happy. Or did you find that like in the kind of looking back, is that something that you experienced? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I think in the inner child work I've done since leaving the church with therapy, um, I loved Legos. I am. Um, I loved nerdy things. I loved like video games. And I say nerdy because that's like how I was like conditioned. Like basically my dad would talk about how if you're tall and you don't play sports that you're a waste of height. Mm. That's how he looked at individuals that didn't ball or play ball. Mm. And so here I am playing basketball, playing football, doing my best, even baseball. Um, I used to joke like, I'm like, Dad, we're in the six foot and under club. Like, we're not really <laughs> built for basketball, but I'll do whatever it takes to make you proud. And I wanted to go play Legos. I wanted to go. I was in, I was secretly in the honor society in high school. I didn't tell anyone. I was secretly mm. in the Spanish club. I was. I did. I did things that were deemed nerdy uh, because I, I was trying to do things that I to, to get that sense of self. Yeah. Because I didn't actually have that sense of self, and so it took. I never really developed it. It was always still performative. It was always for others around me and never for myself. But I think later in life I've realized that sports are great, but they're not all def self defining. There's other things about my life that I want to do, and so that that was that was hard. Just living my life for my grandpa and my mom. Absolutely. And not for myself. And I think too, what comes out of that is sort of that sense of what you just stated. If you love video games, it's like somehow, did you find they were like judged as, as inferior it, because there's nothing to show for that. It, it, it doesn't give your mom mm -hmm. anything to show for that. No. Um, and having to, I would imagine in the rebuilding, having to kind of reframe some of those things where it's like, well, I can just love it. It can just be for me, actually. I don't, it's not about if I have something to show for it. Right. It's just something that I love. It's just who I am. Absolutely. And John, to answer your question about shame, I, I had a lot of Bishop roulette as a teenager and I'd have, I would go in and tell things about, I did with girls and, and some bishops were just like, well, you're doing your best and, and try not to do that again or you know, it was just not a big deal to some of them. And then others, it would be this very, you can't take the sacrament. You need to, there was a lot of shame involved. We need, we need everyone to basically see you for a sinner or that you need to, you know, have one to two months of not taking the sacrament in front of your family. Or when I was a priest, not being able to bless, right? And that was a big deal when you're in this big quorum of all these people notice when so-and-so hasn't blessed in a while or hasn't taken it in a while. And so I was always confused by like, how much shame should I have as a person when I get different levels of shame from different leaders? And obviously you like the bishops more that are more relaxed and chill than the ones that are more intense with the shame. Those are the scarier types of bishops. And so I always felt like it was just a matter of where we lived and what neighborhood we were in and what, you know, what bishop we had at the time. And I got to experience all of those. I, I did have one that was very explicit in asking what exactly I did do with the other teen. And I always thought that was weird. Like, why did you need details about, you know, under the clothes versus over the clothes? Or like, was there touching here or there? And just kind of like, at the time, I didn't question it because it was like, oh, I'm, I'm in trouble here. I did something I shouldn't do. Um, I better give him all the details. And I never questioned that, never questioned being alone, you know, in those interviews. I think now, thank goodness, there is some questioning of that, but it's still not mainstream. But 
um, looking back, that was another layer of shame, having to give details about experiences as a teenager. Yeah. And given how, like, it seems like every month in Utah or Idaho, another Mormon bishop is accused of sexually abusing either a kid or a teen. It just seems to be happening all the time. The idea of this grown man who's got no training sitting alone with a teenage boy or girl behind closed doors asking for sexual details is deeply and set up in a power differential where the bishop gets to determine the worthiness of the of the teen and um you know the the power differential that's involved in the stakes of whatever that bishop decides it can lead to some real spiritual manipulation or abuse and you're nodding i was going to ask you kim how, well, and I know we're going back to you for just a second, but I just don't want to go too far without getting you in here. How was it for you to have a bishop asking you for sexual details mm -hmm. as, a, as a teenage girl in Mormonism? Yeah, as I was listening to him say, like, one of your bishop asked for explicit details and some of them didn't. I started thinking, oh, did they not all ask for yeah. explicit details? Because... They definitely all asked me for explicit step-by-step -step everything that happened, details. And now that I'm thinking about it, like, that's really not okay. I mean, I knew that the one-on-one -on -one interviews were not okay, but I'm not sure that I had really fully thought that process through right until now. Um, mm. And yeah, if my child, I would never let my child be in a room with an untrained man being asked questions about those types of things that just is worrisome. It's troublesome. And, and did you want to answer the same question or, or do you, you may have made the point? Yeah, I think so. I think the point's been made there. Okay. Just kind of, I, I did notice that the one, the bishops that were uh, not as, that they were kinder about it or just even dismissive about it were the ones that were usually involved heavily in the young men's program. So they sort of rooted for you like before maybe they were a bishop. So they had a calling where, they were in young men's, and so it was like, oh, you're a young boy. It's fine. Like, But maybe he questioned the girls more, right? And so I felt like there was a little bit of that, like, at a boy sort of mentality. Like, it's fine. You can mm. – why? because I was shocked. Like, why, are you, why, why is this so dismissive? I thought I'm supposed to be here to repent. And so I thought maybe there was – and I think looking back, maybe there was a – That's so interesting because one time I did something with a boy – and I went to my bishop and told him everything that had happened. And then the bishop contacted his bishop and he got pulled in, which goes against the rules. I don't think you're supposed to go from bishop to bishop. And he didn't have nearly as harsh, harsh of a punishment. It was just like, meh, he was fine. And I had a larger punishment than I actually think was right according to the rule book. <laughs> so and I think that is true. Like there were some uneven punishments towards girls, there was like a higher level of virtue and purity that was expected versus boys will be boys sort of a feeling. Yeah. I did get the boys will be boys sort of feeling from some of them. Yeah. So. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Um, other things you want to say about your life up through high school and mission that were really formative to your later, later story? Yeah, I think, um, did you see a mission as well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think um, the mission's a whole other piece um, that, I mean, it plays into the perfectionism of the youth. I really didn't deal with a whole lot of issues until the mission. Um, so I was sent home four months early from my mission. Um, what would you want to say about that decision? So I went to Tampico, Mexico, and I was out 20 months and you were um, the first of your friends to leave too. First like, of my friends. So everyone saw you go out and leave. First grandkid. First grandkid. First child. Uh, went to Mexico. Um, had a great mission. Uh, very successful mission. There was a lot of baptizing in Mexico. There was a lot of opportunities in Mexico. The church was growing. This was 2007 to 2009. And um, I had trained a lot of elders uh, I was working my way up the ranks. I even became executive secretary uh, to the mission president. And so I was in the mission offices for nine months. 
and um, really worked hard to, to move up. Mexico was kind of a interesting mission, though. Latin America had just a different feel with the rules. Um, commandments were always important, but mission rules were always stretched pretty, pretty thin. I remember some of my early companions when I first started the mission would sneak out and go see girls or do things that I was confused by because we were on a mission. Um, and I was always kind of shocked by that behavior. Um, I even had the, the mission president, the first one I had, he even paired me up with another American elder who uh, was an apostate. Like he didn't believe in the church and he had just three months left of his mission. And mm-hmm. so he he asked me to help finish off this elder, like help him finish his last three months of his mission and see him out the door with honor. And so as a six-month-old missionary, I had to go spend three months with an elder who had his own theories and mm-hmm. was didn't believe. And refused to go out. Refused and- to knock doors, refused to do anything. So I was just kind of stuck for three months with an American elder. So I went from having a trainer who was sneaking out to see girls um, to an apostate sort of elder who didn't believe. Those were some rocky experiences who, as an elder. Didn't he? Who did he worship? He worshiped. Well, he had a theory around Satan is getting the, the like, the, a theory around how Satan, I don't even remember, but that Satan was also the son of God and that he was dealt the bad card. And yeah, he had some interesting. Some weird theories. And I just ignored him because my job as the, to, to make sure that I was people pleasing and, and, and listening to the mission president was to get this elder through his three last months. And um, then I got 19 months into my mission. Um, I've been in the mission offices for eight months as executive secretary. This mission president was much more understanding and loving. He's a big teddy bear of a man. Um, And a lot of rules were broken during his tenure. A lot of elders did what they wanted, but we were very successful. Lots of baptisms. And um, I even knew of elders who were having intimate relations with girls in the mission. and Meaning sex? Yes, having sex during their mission and with, with local girls. And um, and I would have elders tell me that, and I would just try to be like their friend. And, you know, it was a lonely experience. So you're in Mexico. You don't understand the language for the first 6 to 12 months. It's really lonely. You're not allowed to call your parents. You, you can email them once a week. You can't. I mean, you're just lonely. I remember crying myself to sleep during the first six months because I couldn't understand the language. I didn't know where I was. My companions were breaking rules. This wasn't what I was told by the church this would be. And I always was told, like, oh, it's a Latin America mission. Like, rules are just broken here. It's not like the states where they're super strict. Mm -hmm. And we have lots of baptisms here. So it was always kind of like the rules can be broken. And so I very quickly broke down. Like it was like, oh, I guess we can go to the beach on P day and have four baptisms. That you know, two days before that, and um, the success of the numbers always made us feel like we were somewhat above the rules. But then we got a new mission president during my last month of the mission, and he was a BYU football player and a military man, and he came in and very quickly cleaned up the mission. Um, I was the first of many to be sent home. Um, I was told somewhere in the number of 20 to 30 elders were sent home within his first three months in Mexico. And I was the one, one well, of the I first mean, if missionaries are having sex, sure. that's a problem. Sure. Well, a lot <laughs> of them... It was more than just missionaries having sex that were getting sent sure. home. Sure. Well, I didn't, I didn't do anything like that, mm-hmm. but I knew of elders who did. And I also saw elders go home with honor that were doing those things. And when he came in to try oh, to clean things missionaries up. missionaries having sex, but were... Released st- after f- their two full years were up. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I okay. know of several. And I and I just kind of saw that as part of this mission. And sure, he came in as a new mission president, and rightly so, wanted to clean things up. But he also pulled me aside and was like, you're a ringleader. You break a lot of rules. You know a lot of things about other elders. You're an office elder who who has influence. And I want you to tell me now of all these elders you know about that have done bad things, even the ones that have been home, who have gone home with honor. And I refused to, I refused to narc. I refused to tell on 
other elders. I didn't. I never felt like I was an ecclesiastical leader who should tell on other. Like that's between them and God is kind of how I always thought of it. And I he didn't like that, and so I was one of the first ones sent home for breaking rules. And I always like to tell people I broke rules, not commandments. I went to the beach. Uh, I think we saw the Avengers in movie theater one time. Yeah. Small things. I, I bought my own cell phone on the mission where... Because he had terrible anxiety. Uh, to call my mom or my dad or text my mm-hmm. brother. It just makes me really sad Like when he's told me experiences because I know he struggles with anxiety. And he felt so unsafe on his mission. Like You guys would get robbed. You didn't have warm water. You many times went to bed hungry. Your companions didn't have money for food. You paid for their food so many times. There were so many basic needs. Like you have Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And you need to have all of those things, like a safe place to sleep, food and water, all of these things in order to have good mental health or even function normally in the world. And those basic needs weren't being met and you're paying to be on this mission where you don't have enough food to eat. (laughs) I just... It makes me so upset to, to think about that. Like, there's no shortage of money. Yeah, we so were always why, sure. Yeah. Why are these elders living in these? Yeah, if, if the Mormon Church has 150 billion dollars in cash and stocks and bonds, mm-hmm. at least, mm-hmm. and missionaries are paying for their own missions, yeah. mm-hmm. why are missionaries mm-hmm. going hungry? Well, yeah. And I had saved up for my own mission, so most of my mission was paid for by myself. So 400 dollars a month was coming from my own account. Wow. My grandpa also helped with some of it, but I, I was paying right. And often the Latin American elders I was with didn't pay their own way and they wouldn't have much money. And so I would go pull out of my, I used to carry my debit card in my sock because my, my debit card in my sock meant if we got robbed or our backpacks were taken, I'd still have my source of money. Mm-hmm. And no one were you robbed in, on your mission? Multiple times. What? Yeah. Multiple times. By gunpoint or? Not gunpoint. It was always knife point or just like multiple, worse. multiple That's people. Knife. Just, just knife. Just point. Well, I guess, well, knife. I guess I have friends who've been, at gunpoint in mm. Africa, so I always think that it's less it's still than. Still terrible. But I know yeah. I sort of minimize what happened, but yeah. they're breaking rules. Elders are breaking rules. It's the mission's not what I thought it was. We're having lots of baptisms though, so I think it's successful. But we're always out of money, and so I'm reaching out to family, asking for more money. Hey, I want to buy tacos at night for myself because I'm hungry, and I have I live in a home with three other elders who don't have any money. I need to buy food for the four of us, and so I'd have generous family put money on my personal debit card, and I'd buy so many things for, you know, these elders to get through it. Um, Well, and many times the members couldn't afford to feed you. They were in poverty. And even if they did feed you, the conditions of their kitchen were not always sanitary. And so you got sick so many times. I lost 40 pounds in the first eight months just from like not being able to keep Keep sanitary food down. down. And we walked everywhere and um, you know, I learned a lot during all of that, but it was like not what they say a mission will be. It's not a stateside mission. It was, it, it felt very much third world, world country. Like even though it was Mexico and there was some Americanized things about it, um, we were definitely alone. And it was the anxiety and depression was really bad. I didn't know what that was at the time. 2007, anxiety and depression was barely spoken about. Mm-hmm. And when missionaries would go home for mental health issues. It was he couldn't hack it Mm -hmm. or he's weak or whatever mean thing they would say to dismiss or he, you know, he can't, he can't, he can't do it. And so I didn't know I had bad anxiety. I didn't know what that was. I just was always a high performer. And so I thought I was just trying to do, you know, I got to get through this mission. I can't, I always had my mom's voice in the back of my head. You will go on a mission. (laughs) Even when I was a teenager with girls, I would run away from a situation with a girl because my mom's voice was, you will go on a mission. (laughs) So I had this constant, like, I cannot disappoint my, mo- my mother. I cannot disappoint my grandfather. And so I'm out on this mission going, well, I have this, my first, my trainer, the guy who's supposed to teach me how to be a missionary is sneaking out at night to go see a girl. Do I call the mission president? Like, do I narc on him? Do I have a conversation with him? And a lot of missionaries tried to make me reassure me that this is just part of the mission. Like, it's okay. And I was so green and so unaware of Spanish. I'm just trying to learn Spanish. That I'm just like, okay, well, we're still, we're, we're teaching lessons, we're knocking doors, we're baptizing people all the time. Mm-hmm. We're doing what we're supposed to. It's fine if you have a, gr- a girlfriend 
Like that was my justification. And then to have an elder for three months who didn't believe in the church, and my job was to help him finish his mission according to the president so he could return with honor, um, was also a really terrible experience. Because for three months I sat in a room and just hung out with an American elder, and he taught me Spanish, and we went and got tacos. But he, w- he refused to work. He's like, I'm not going to work for these last three months of my mission. Mm-hmm. I'm only here because of my mother. And so I get about seven, eight months into my mission, and that's my experience so far. And um, then I trained a few elders, and that was actually great because I got to be the one who determined what it was like. You know, I got to train some fresh, fresh missionaries, and then I got put in the mission offices. And that was actually a great experience because I got to answer the mission office phone. I learned really good Spanish that way. I got to meet a lot of people in the mission home. And I was often by myself because there was the two assistants to the president. And then there was the financial elder, financial secretary elder, and the materials elder. So there were four elders in the mission office that would go out in their pairs of two. But I was the executive secretary, and so I would also often be with the mission president. He was kind of considered my companion, which was mm-hmm. kind of interesting. We had one older couple that was there, um, and that was it. That was the entire mission office. And we only had two cars in the entire mission. There was the mission president's car and then the big van that we would pick up pick up elders. <coughs> one time recently, too, John, I got asked about, as an executive secretary in the mission offices, what were some of my responsibilities? Well, I got to keep, and I didn't realize this was so bad, but I kept the visas and the passports of all the elders in the entire mission Mm -hmm. under lock and key. I was the one who would go to the immigration offices to get them renewed every six months, get them stamped for approval. That was my job. And uh, I had a constant cycle of that because, you know, every every three weeks or every six weeks, there would be another wow. group of visas I needed to take in and get stamped. So I have to present passport and the elders would show up. I'd have them meet me there at the immigration offices and I would present their visa and their passport. And I would keep that in the mission office um, under lock and key and didn't think much of it. Like I was just responsible for keeping track of all those documents. So in theory... If an elder wanted to leave the mission and fly home, they could not unless they came to the mission office to get their documents, which I always thought was kind of odd, but I, didn't, I guess I didn't question it at the time, but I, yeah, I do now. I know. Um, and what was hard for me is that, you know, I got this choice to tell on other missionaries with this new mission president. He came in ready to, to make some changes into the mission, and I wasn't really willing to repent for others or talk for others or speak for others. And so I went home without honor because I wouldn't, I wouldn't lie or I wouldn't tell the truth about other elders. I wouldn't be that person. And so I think that, that, that one's always affected me because I've always looked back and said, should I have just told on those elders? Should I have, should I have been selfish? I could have had an honorable full-time release Mm -hmm. if I had just told on the other elders and several others were sent home right after me. Um, there was a, a bunch of us. There were elders that reached out to me who got an honorable release just before I had got sent home who who had been having sex with girls on the mission who would apologize to me. Like, you got sent home. You didn't get the the glory or the the honorable return. And this was, this was devastating to my, my mom and to my grandpa. Like, I didn't have a homecoming talk. I, it was a dishonorable discharge. Like it was like, I kept my recommend. Yeah. I like to tell people that because they're like, oh, you must have done something. I had my recommend. I didn't lose my recommend, which means I was sent home for breaking rules, not commandments. But there were elders who broke commandments and, and rules and, and rules, rules and got an honorable uh, release with the, with the nicer mission president who yeah. really just didn't want to know the details of what was going on because he had been in his third year mm-hmm. and was very tired. And so I got to have a little bit of leadership roulette, right? My first, I, I, I love the man that was my first mission president. I had him for 19 months. I learned a lot. Um, obviously, there were things in the mission that weren't great. Um, but I, 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 he was so loving and kind. Even when he would be informed of things, he would, he would move elders to another area. or He would do things to try and, to try and keep, keep these elders, you know, in the mission, um, he was very kind. I even met him later on. Yeah. Before we got married, while we were dating, he was so sweet. 
and spoke so highly of you. And that was hard for me to understand, like how could this <laughs> mission leader speak so highly of this person who was sent home? Like how can you have these two things coexisting mm. at the same time? It's almost mm-hmm. like two missions. You're, it was like 19 months with yeah. him and then yeah. one month with the new, the new mission president. And he actually reached out to me uh, about a year later after sending me home early and wanted to sort of reconcile. He wanted to tell me he was sorry for... I don't remember the words exactly, but it was about sort of being too harsh or mm-hmm. too, yeah, too rulesy or too, you know, because I didn't do anything that should have sent me home. It was I wouldn't tell on others, and I broke some rules that I could have easily repented for or moved areas. You know, going to the beach and having a cell phone and going to the movies once or twice was not, in my book, a reason to be sent home when there was so much other things happening. There. Yeah, and I'll just say, like, for those who don't understand Mormon culture— uh, being sent home from your to your Mormon mission can be devastating in terms of your reputation, your uh, how you're perceived by fellow members of your ward, by family members, by women or men that you might want to date. You're basically shunned and shamed. It's going to be assumed by all that if you come home early, you committed some sort of sexual transgression, which again is considered to be next to murder and severity, but you're also just a huge disappointment. It's like, uh, yeah, it, it's just being viewed as a, as a spiritual failure and as a evil, sinful person. And so it's, it's wrong that they do that for people who have sex on their missions. That's awful and horrible. Like, where's Christ? Where's the atonement? Where's forgiveness? Where's mental, you know, working with people? But to send someone home and to put that shame and stigma and scarlet letter on them for simply like not buckling to coercive pressure from a new mission president trying to make a statement, that feels horrifically abusive to me, given the consequences Mm -hmm. of that decision that would have affected you. I don't mean to put all that on your experience what was it like coming home early? It was a great description of everything that happened. I, I already said that my mom and my grandpa, like facing them, was. Mm-hmm. I was already this high-performing kid, the oldest of eighteen grandkids. I didn't make mistakes. I didn't mess up. But even harder than facing my family, was coming home and wanting to date again and wanting to like be a part of this Idaho Falls community that was very heavily LDS. And I remember reaching out to a couple girls that I had dated in high school who were now, you know, 18 or 19. And I remember I called one of them up and said, hey, I'm home and I'd like to take you on a date. And um, we had dated in high school for several months and we were pretty close. And she said, "Um, uh, I can meet you at a public park. And I was like, uh, okay. And she's like, and my mom wants my friend to come. And I was like, oh, I, I was hoping to take you on like a date and like, you know, talk again. And she says, well, we'll meet you at the park at this time. And so I got to the park and there's this girl that I dated my last year of high school. And I loved her. She was my true first love. And she sat on a park bench (laughs) with her best friend telling me that I was, like, unworthy to, to date. Like, I had come home early, mm-hmm. and um, her parents didn't want her to have anything to do with me, and uh, I just was in shock. I was just like, I don't understand. Like, I'm, I have my temple recommend. Like, we can go to a session. Like, I'm going to BYU-Idaho soon. Like, th- this was, it was devastating to me. I just, I like, couldn't. I, I was in shock. Like, why would you, why would this judgment be so harsh? You don't even know what I did wrong. Like, you don't know why I was sent home early. And uh, it happened actually three different times where local families that I grew up with around in my local wards um, basically had said, I'm sorry, but I don't. And I think rumors spread. I think people just think, oh, he's home early. Like, And it was weird because I was gone 20 months. I was almost done. Mm -hmm. I was four months away. And um, I think I'll forever be judged for not finishing the four months. 
so close. Mm-hmm. And after two years, almost two years of just grinding through, like, all the disobedience in the mission and, like, yeah. like this wasn't what I thought it would be. <laughs> and we had so much success. Like, I'm like, we're baptizing people. We're doing good. We're having so many lessons. The people were so receptive to us in Mexico. They loved American elders. We we won a lot of people over. <laughs> we brought a lot of gospel to a lot of people. And um, I just was reje- I was fully rejected by the community in which I grew up. I don't know how I stayed in the church after that. I was just so scared of like... Um, like the eternities, like I want to have an eternal marriage, um, and so I have to date Mormon girls, and if I've had three Mormon girls reject me for coming home early, like what what's gonna happen to me? Yeah. And so, um, and that's when I met Kim. I met Kim at that point, mm-hmm. and uh, the only thing she asked me was. <sighs> Did you learn from the experience? (laughs) She was 18 and I was 21. And the only thing she cared about was like, not what I did on my mission or like what happened or am I worthy? (laughs) She said, did you learn from the experience? Like, did you, are, are you like, are you, do you have sorrow for what happened? And are you moving on? Like she was understanding about it. Godly sorrow. Godly, Godly sorrow. Godly. It was the first girl that gave me the space to, like, heal or just feel like I had value because yeah. I'd already been rejected by my family and then my whole community in Idaho Falls, which is, like, very clicky, very Mormon. Everyone knows everyone. <laughs> it's a city of about 100,000, so it just – everybody seems to know everyone in the stakes. Yeah. And when you don't get to have your homecoming talk, it's like, what happened to Elder Coffin? Like, why didn't he give a talk? It's like, well, I went to the movies and I went to the beach and then I didn't tell on all the other elders. Like the new mission president wanted me to. So it's so painful. You were you were paying yeah. to be shamed and so twenty months and of abused. It, yeah. yeah. Unacceptable. Like you're the church you're paying to be the church's salesperson. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what you get in return is the destruction of your reputation and self esteem. It reminds me a little bit of what happens too when people transition away from Mormonism within a family system that's really embedded in Mormonism is the things that I think you individually can feel proud about, your collective views in a way of a failing. You're a failure actually. And that's what I see a little bit here is just like you're talking about your early story as being one where you're so about approval. You're so about what other people want for you. But on your mission, you actually did some things that feel like they were for you. Yeah. Like you you went against doing the thing you'd always done. And you had a moment with authority where they were asking something and you had like an ethics moment moment where you were like, I get this and I could do the approval thing and I know what that looks like and you can, and it's like, no, no, I'm not going to do it. And you, you know, and all that ensued, but really in a moment, it's sort of like a coming to, like you came back around to yourself as opposed to doing the approval thing, which is like, there's so much to be, you know, to like really love about that. For you as this young person in a system that's all about control and power and you're paying for and all those things. And you did it anyway, you know, you you individuated enough to allow yourself to, you know, be a disruptor for a minute. Not even probably wanting to be a disruptor, but (laughs) like you, you emerged as an individual in a system in that moment, you know? That's such a good reframe. I I really appreciate that because... It's always been just such a source of shame, especially when we were in the church. Because, like, later on you get asked, like, did you serve a mission? Did you serve a full-time mission? That was often how that question was phrased. Like, did you serve a full-time mission? It's like, well, I served 20 out of 24 months. Like, is that is that enough? I had X number of baptisms. Like, is that enough? Like, what, what do you need from me? And you're right. It was the first time that I said, you know what? There's a superhero movie in theaters, 
and I have been grinding my ass off out here yes. in the hot sun. I've lost 40 pounds. I can't yes. keep any of the food down. I've had all the success that they want, all the metrics that they, I report back. I've trained all these new elders. I'm going to go see this superhero movie Yes. because I want to on my P-Day. And I'm going to go find some other elders and go to the beach on our P-Day morning because those are like normal human things to do, to go to a beach on our day off. But to the new mission president, <laughs> that was like terrible. Like you're rounding up elders and going to a place that we have forbidden you to go after a certain hour because the thing was you could go to the beach in the morning on P-Day. But you'd have to leave by noon because that's when the people would show up in bikinis. And so his rule was you could be at the beach in the early morning, play some football and soccer on the beach. Can't get in the water, obviously. And that was the rule. We would mm -hmm. stay and have a whole day at the beach because mm -hmm. that was super reasonable to us as 19, 20-year-old men. <laughs> yeah. I think we sometimes forget how young you are, too, on this mission where you're expected to have complete so adherence true. to this intense set of rules. And you're just these young boys with little to no experience living on your own, dealing with mental health issues. Well, and, and we didn't really even talk and, about how lonely with it, like the reason we would buy our own phone, because you could buy a phone in Mexico for $10 and I could text home for 10 cents. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it was like, I'm going to buy a phone and I'm going to text my dad. Yeah. And I'm going to call my mom on, a, you know, a rent, not every day, like once a month or once every quarter. Yeah. But the e the weekly email to the family was all I had. And that is not enough because we know so much more now about mental health and anxiety and depression. And the church has made some changes. Um, and they like to do a revisionist history of like, oh, now we let the elders and the sisters communicate on Facebook with their family. And they can text home and they can call. I got two calls a year, Mother's Day and Christmas. That was my official amount of time that I was allowed to call my family. And so, and the email, the weekly email, right? Which just feels so distant, right? You're just writing a story about your week and you send it off. And then you read the replies six days later. Yeah. And then you write another story about how your week was. And there's just, there's no intimacy. There's no family. You're just, and you're in a, this lonely world. And I, I feel for the foreign speakers, John, you've talked about other episodes where there's this weird, like, where you get your mission call, and mm -hmm. is it is it cool? Is it foreign speaking? There's, like, this weird culture within Mormonism that if you go stateside, it's kind of lame, but if you go somewhere foreign, it's super awesome. And so getting the Mexico call was, like, the coolest thing ever, like Spanish. and and um, But it's lonely because those, those foreign elders who go to a foreign land where they learn a different language, you spend the first 6 to 12 months just learning the language. Not only how to understand it and listen to it, but also how to speak it. And even after a year, you're not perfect, but you, your second year is always a little better because you can finally say things how you want to say them. And, but the loneliness of the first six to 12 months, nobody talks about that. Like, it's just so lonely. Yeah. And I'd have companions who didn't speak a word of English. So I'm alone with someone who can't understand me. I can't understand them. Yeah. And I've got to try to figure out how to navigate this world of we don't have enough money. <laughs> I can't speak. Like That's right. So the whole thing was just like a mental health nightmare. I'm glad they're letting elders talk to their families now. I think that's a good change the church has made, but it's still a ridiculous experience at that age to not have the mental health help that you might need. It's Absolutely. Yeah. Especially if they're going to require um you know, so many things that are just, they're inhumane, really. It's an in inhumane mm -hmm. way to to live and to be expected to live. And then within that steep, steep, unreasonable expectation, when you are trying to, what I love is that it just, it really feels like a moment where you refuse to become inhuman. You you were like, I have needs. Mm -hmm. I I have needs. I need to text family. I need to go to this movie today. Um, I need, and it, and it really is about you in those moments, I think, you know, allowing yourself to be real to yourself in a climate where no one else was seeing that that was even important. It actually doesn't benefit them to have people who are connected, you know? So mm -hmm. the fact that you awakened in that way, right. 
you know, in this climate of just how systemically challenging that was, like I would celebrate the hell out of that with my kids. I'd be like, that's what we want. Appreciate that. It's a nice reframe. Um, it's always been a source of shame for me. I obviously with therapy and an understanding wife and leaving the church, it's a lot less now than it was before, but it's always just been a source of like pain and yeah. rejection yeah. and failure. And um Yeah, because that's what you experienced. Yeah. And and at a level there I just thought was like my life might be over. Like this is I've I've never failed to, to this regard. Like, how do I tell my grandfather? How do I tell mm. my Yes. My mother, how do I tell these girls that I dated? How do I how do I go to BYU Idaho with my head held high mm. as an honorable return missionary? Like do I check the box that I've served a mission when I fill out my BYU Idaho application? Right. Do you like consider all those do you things. consider those twenty months valid? How about all the souls that I brought unto Christ? Do those, do they matter? Yes. Right? Like and so it just made me question everything I had done. Like none of it. None of it had value because it wasn't 24 months. Mm -hmm. And so that was just painful because it was like, did I waste Did I waste this time? Like, this was supposed to be this big accomplishment of my life. Like, this is what I lived my whole life for. Yeah. This is why I did or didn't do things in high school so that I could go on, so I could stay eligible for this mission. Yeah. Because right? I look back to my teen years and it's like, why, what, why did I not have sex as a teen? Because I wanted to go on a mission. Yes. That kept me... I had my mother's voice in my head. You will go on a mission. You will not mess up. You will go on a mission. That was my goal. And so when that goal doesn't go the way you thought it would. So um, makes sense. All the sacrifices that you made in your life with that, the you being the exemplary oldest grandchild, it totally makes sense that when you're sent home and then you have those experiences, it's like the loss goes all the way back all the way back yeah. to all the sacrifices you've made, to all the focus that you had, to all the things that you did in trying to have that approval and to be the best. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I wasn't able to be displayed when I got home. I wasn't able to make my mom or grandpa proud. Yeah. Like I, my accomplishment was, it actually was a source of shame for them that I, I wasn't able to have this big talk in the stake. Yeah. And it's like... It was for me, not for you. But I was just trying to live for you, yeah. not for myself. It's a tough way to be a youth and a teen. Yes. I was a teenager, not an adult, right? I was 19. So, anyway. I'm so sorry that happened. Yeah, both of you had rough Yes, we feel so much And I want to say it. that's super abnormal in Mormonism, but I just, I get these stories daily, dozens and dozens of these stories just daily. Just the harm. So, uh, and the church is known for like good, clean families and good, smart, achieving children. But I guess, and and th that can happen. But I also, there's a dark side to these perfection-driven Mormon families, and and um, you know a lot of these Mormon beliefs and practices, even outside of prepperism. In your case, yeah, even outside the preppers, it was just more about perfectionism and, and, and also a loss of community, right? I, I lived my whole life for a community and to like, feel like you lost your community and be rejected by that full community was so difficult. So maybe as we're wrapping up this part one, yeah. um, and this has been really, really powerful. And I know it's going to mean a lot to a lot of people. I think I'm going to have Julia make a short, like a lot, we call them longer shorts, just of your, mission experience of getting sent home because I think yeah. that that story needs to be teased out so that uh, it could be shared as its own example of early mission return and how shaming and stigmatizing that is. So I'm going to have Julia do that for sure. Uh, but let's go ahead and just close out your story about your getting married and um, – and then we'll go to part two, which because the the book Visions of Glory comes out after you're married, yeah, right? While we're in college, and I'm and I'm guessing that things with with your dad, um, Kim, maybe even start to ramp up and escalate, and then that's when Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow and all of the other stuff really starts to happen that mm -hmm. we're gonna 
get your perspectives on, um, yeah. along with your own faith journey. But what would each of you like to say about your marriage and, you know, those early years pre visions of glory? <laughs> yeah. I think getting married in the temple was like the saving grace for, for both of us in a way. Like you felt like unworthy from your childhood and I felt unworthy from being sent home early from my mission. Mm -hmm. But to get sealed together in, in, in the Rexburg Temple um, in 2010, um, you know, you were 18, I was 21. Mm -hmm. That felt like a sort of clean slate in some ways, at least for me, because I was so worried about, you know, not being eligible to be married in the temple or to have girls reject me because I was sent home early or who wouldn't even hear me out or hear my story. And so in some ways for me, it was like this great new era or this awesome this person who loved me, who accepted me for who I was and for my flaws and my weaknesses. And and for me, it was the time of joy, just like being able to have someone who cared about me and showed me that kind of love where it wasn't conditional, truly mm -hmm. was unconditional. I don't know about for you. Such a, You're so young. I was very young. Yeah, 18 I, is a really early age to get married. Very young. Had you gone to any college? No. Oh, I wow. met Josh when I was 17, 17 and a half. Um, I was very young. And again, I think my scrupulosity played into that a lot. I always wanted to do things on a faster timeline than other people. So in my mind, like, why waste all this time at BYUI dating and doing all these things? Why not get married as soon as you can and start having kids right away? If, if our sole purpose on earth is to multiply and replenish... Why would I want to put that off? And I mean, I look back now and realize that that train of thought is very flawed, but that, that is where my mind was at in those years. Um, and so, you know, I asked myself that question, what do they say? Right time, right person, right place. And I was like, well, I can, I feel like I can mark all three of those things. So why would we wait? Yeah. Because my father was very against us getting married. My mother was wholly supportive of it, which I find somewhat problematic. I don't think I should have been encouraged to get married that young. Um, but also like my father not wanting us to get married was more just he didn't like you and it didn't fit his plan for my life. So we, we did everything on a quick timetable. We got married very young. Well, so I met you in high school when you were in high school and I thought that it was awkward because uh, she was more mature than I was. She had all these goals. She was like, I want to, you know, graduate high school. I want to get my degree. I want to get married in the temple. I want to have kids right away. And I was like, I just want to go to BYU-Idaho. Like, I didn't have those. I, I loved that she was so mature. At 17 and a half, I was 21 and felt broken. She had this plan laid out. And so when my parents were like, you're not marrying an 18-year-old. You're not, you know, that's weird. And why would you do that? Um, even among Mormonism, they thought that was kind of weird. And I said, well, she has this plan. Like, she's ready to 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 take this plan. Like, and I want to, you know, meet those standards. Mm -hmm. I want to do the same thing. And so we kind of pushed back against my parents and her dad. Mm -hmm. And your mom was the only one that supported us. And it kind of was crazy because it was BYU-Idaho. So it's like you go into this place where it's a higher – we got married and then we both started as freshmen at BYU-Idaho mm, together. Later. Yeah. A week later. Yeah. Wow. And so you go from being too young to get married, doing it anyway, and then you go to this very, very strict religious university that has, you know, more intense rules than any other place in the United States, I would I would assume. Well, yeah, most colleges. To the point where, yeah, like you can't yeah. wear sandals, you can't wear shorts, no beards. It was just super strict. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of, we were super young. But also, like, you're not allowed to have sex until you're married. Mm -hmm. I think that's the super important point that, like, mm -hmm. can we, we just talk about that for a second? Like, <laughs> that is huge. Yeah, had we been able to have sex, like, who knows where we would have gone? Like, yeah. I, I, we loved each other. But, like, and we're so also happy that we are married. But had we just been allowed to have sex, we would not have gotten married at the age that we did because we were too young to get married. Like, our brains were not fully formed. We did not have great life experience like that just isn't really also just self-knowledge yeah yeah, yeah. Right? self-development like, yeah. self plus all the trauma you both had been through Jeez. yeah yeah Should having a moment to work through that yes healed and treated your your respective traumas mm -hmm. 
-hmm. That's tough to bring into a marriage, so untreated true. trauma at a young Very age. Very tough. Very tough. Yeah. And Josh always frames it as me being mature. And I always kind of laugh and say, I think what you were seeing really was just like some of my mental illness that was untreated that looked like maturity. And it wasn't really. It was, I had just had a lot of trauma growing up. Mm -hmm. And it looks like maturity sometimes for those of us, especially who are highly dissociative, high performers. That's right. Yeah. Such a, that is such a good point, Kim. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we started college together and two perfectionist overperformers <laughs> get married and we're like, okay, how can we do this the most efficient way possible on the fastest track <laughs> and oh. also have kids at the same time? <sighs> wow. Not you aware guys. of any of our mental health struggles. We both worked full time so, and did school full time. I managed the married housing on campus. I was actually mm -hmm. a staff member. Uh, I was an insured staff member at BYU Idaho. So I was. Uh, I would I would charge married rent to a students account. I would it was 156 apartments. It's called University Village, and um, I managed all the married housing that the school funded. And she managed the girls' mm -hmm. dorm up up the road. And so we mm -hmm. both were housing managers full time, going to school full time in Rexburg, Idaho, where we got married in the temple, that temple up on the Rexburg's hill there. And uh, just overachieving in every way possible to get through our degrees. Mm -hmm. We did have our oldest daughter our senior year. So we did make it three mm -hmm. years without kids. That's a little edgy. I'm, you know. Little, yeah, I know. Yeah. But, but to get through, it's funny. we call it BYU I, I do, or BYU, uh, yeah. BYU I, do, I do, because everyone gets married so quick. Yeah. Yeah. We felt a lot of pressure to have a child mm -hmm. as freshmen, mm -hmm. sophomore, and juniors. Wow. And I remember we fought that hard because mm -hmm. I was like, there were rumors when we got married. Well, a lot of people thought if you're getting married as an 18-year-old, it must be because you're having sex or you must be pregnant and you need to cover it up. So Wait, no. It's in more, My understanding of Mormonism is that's what you do. So, but 18 but, was too young. Okay. If I was 19 and I had a Got it. semester of college, that would be acceptable. Okay. But 18. Okay. Interesting. Somehow. That's so okay. interesting. So, so 18 was too young, 19 okay. We get married okay. and nine months later, there's no baby. And people are like, oh, she wasn't pregnant? <laughs> no, I wasn't pregnant. And we got married in the temple. And, yeah. And it was so interesting. And so we start school. And BYUI has this interesting track system where you can really get all of your schooling done pretty quickly. That three you can years. do three semesters a year plus an additional semester during the Christmas break. So we were doing four semesters in a year. Wow. Like and, and we and would half, both yeah. take like 18 to 20 credits. Just like. Again, because we felt that need to overperform. <laughs> that dissociative anxiety of performance. Like mm -hmm. we're going to get through this degree as fast as we can did all these internships. Mm -hmm. We did fight having the child, though, because there was mm -hmm. that sort of like, I'm glad that people thought that she was pregnant when we got married because it kept us from having a baby yeah. for a few years. We got to actually know each other a little bit in mm -hmm. three years yeah. and have a few vacations and just try to be like a young married couple. But we did have Maddie our senior year. But I did have a really great teacher, one of my clothing construction teachers. She advised me once she said she got married very young and her husband was, um, he was a pilot and he died and she had a bunch of children and she had no way to support them once he had passed. And so she told me, she said, you got very, you got married very young. You need to finish your education. If anything happens to your husband, you will not have a way to support those children. And she says, I've seen too many women get married and think that that's the end all be all and they have no way of supporting themselves. And if something ever goes wrong, be it you get divorced or he dies or in some way he is disabled, you need to have something that you can fall back on. And I'm glad that I took her advice to heart. At the time, it was kind of edgy to, for her to say those things. Like I, we were counseled so many times like that my education really didn't matter as much as yours and that I should just start having babies. But I'm glad that she shared that with me because I was able to get my degree and I got almost my entire degree done in three years. I was supposed to graduate in three years. And then that very last semester, I was supposed to ha um, have my last semester and then have my baby a few days later. But that um, I ended up having some preterm labor and got put on bed rest. And so that kind of threw off our 
one more semester. We I had to do stay. one more Ooh. semester. Well, and, and the people were often dismissive of your degree. I remember a lot of the men in my family, like my engineer grandfather mm-hmm. and all the CPA uncles and aunts that I have, she studied marriage and family therapy. And or and I have I have siblings who did sociology. And mm-hmm. if it wasn't like an engineering degree or I have an accounting degree, like that's what men study, right? And the women's degrees don't matter as much mm-hmm. was kind of the rhetoric that – and I remember saying, no, I don't care what your degree is in. Your education matters. You need to finish. Screw what mm-hmm. the rest of these men say, including your father. Like, Well, th- even my teachers too were saying – I was trying to figure out how do I go and do my graduate degree and also support my husband because – your job was in one place and the graduate program I wanted to go to was in a very different place. My teachers were advising me, just go and support your husband. That is your role. And that was, it felt a little defeating to have Mm -hmm. to put my ambitions on the back burner. What did you want to do in grad school? I wanted to be a marriage and family therapist. Okay, where? Um, I was looking at a few colleges that were in Texas, because that's where we were moving. But it would have meant that we had to live separately and commute back and forth. Okay. Which I was always supportive of. We did have our our daughter our senior year, but it was like a really hard time for, like at BYU Idaho had this culture of that the women's degrees didn't matter as much as the mm-hmm. men's. And the engineering classes, the accounting classes were like 95% men. There just were very few women in any of those you know, whatever you want to call it. But it was just, there was this system of patriarchy that the girls would drop out Mm -hmm. to support the husbands. Or like if the husband had an internship, the women would go with them, right? And it was never the opposite. And so- Yeah, we were kind of a strange couple in that I stayed when you went on your internship. I stayed back and kept my job and stayed in school. People were like, oh, you're going to get a divorce. You can't be separated for three months. And I was like, well, my degree is really important to me and my job is important to me. And I was all for you staying because yeah. I was like, I can do 12 weeks alone in a dorm in San Jose, California mm-hmm. at an accounting internship and you can stay at BYUI and finish the things mm-hmm. you want to finish. We spent 12 weeks apart our junior year so that she could keep going on her degree because it mattered. And yeah. yeah. And honestly, mm-hmm. my degree was life changing for us to learn so much about what family systems should look like, what healthy yes. family relationships look like, to learn about child development, to learn different parenting methods and techniques. And that was when I started realizing like, oh, there were some things that happened in my childhood that were not normal. Mm. <laughs> and we're not going to do these things. We're not going to pass on these ideas and these values to our children. And even when I would come to the marriage with like my sort of contentious upbringing of having to look perfect, she would say, no, no, no. Because of the schooling that she had, she would say, no, no, this is how a real relationship, like neither of us knew what a healthy relationship looked like. Yeah. But because yeah. of her degree, it helped us like form some better habits early on. It's some um, guideposts. Yeah. Right. Even though all the people were dismissive of her degree, like it wasn't be- good enough, which still just ticks me off to this day because Isn't it's like, something? it was so impactful to us and to mm-hmm. you, right? And she did take her minor. Her minor was clothing construction. And that she took into building her business that she Mm -hmm. does now, which is sewing and crafting and online content, right? So she still used her education. I mean, she learned how to make every type of clothing there is during her minor. Um, But I just hate the dismissiveness of women's education. I've always thought that was bizarre. Or women working. I've always thought that was like, anyway, sorry. Too much feminism coming out of my mouth. (laughs) Um. I'm curious whether you, uh, Kim, brought Mormon prepperism into your marriage, whether you Mm -hmm. rejected that or still believed it, and whether that kind of this Mormon neo-fundamentalism, whether it informed your marriage at all. Um, I definitely brought it into our marriage. You did. And definitely still was struggling with scrupulosity. So I, I think it hasn't been until recently that you found out just how much was going on inside of my head that I didn't share with you. I was very, very quiet when we first got married. I like barely spoke. (laughs) Um, So it's taken me several years to find my voice and to even just figure out what it is that I feel or think. And so, yeah, I definitely had a lot of things going on in my head, but I don't think I voiced them as much to you. But we... Our pantry was filled with food storage, and we were trying to prepare for things. We had lots of little things 
we would spend money on to, you know, you need to buy this and you need to have that. And we did have, we took security in knowing that my father had all the things that we would need and he bought, I think, a year's worth of food storage. I think it was five years or something. When we got married for you, and that was like his present to you. Welcome to the family. <laughs> you can live with us if the you know if the end times happens during our lifetime. Thanks, Dad. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely brought some of those things in. And on occasion, I would read a book here and read a book there. And I, like I said before, I feel like I had these like waves of scrupulosity where it would focus on different things. And sometimes it was prepping, and sometimes it was other religious things. Yeah, perfectionism, yeah. yeah. Being the perfect mom, being the mm-hmm. perfect wife. Mm-hmm. I think um, my desire to prep or take part in those materials online, uh, it was worse after I had a baby. Yeah. I remember it was really bad after I had... Postpartum? No, right out, right before Maddie. we had Lincoln because we were living in Dallas. Dallas, Texas, and we were 10 minutes away from the Ebola outbreak. I don't know if you remember that, but when it first happened, it was really scary in that area. And I thought, like, in that book, it talks about, does it say a virus or? It was 2015. This was going yeah. 2014. That we John, were in do you Dallas. remember in the Visions of Glory book, it talks about... A virus? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, like a man-made virus that will cover you in in bumps like and spots, and then you would it would leak pus and you would die. And it would be so terrible that you would put yourself in a body bag and zip it up to die in there so that your family wouldn't be exposed to it. <laughs> and there oh, was wow. an Ebola. Bre- it was the breakout, and in then there Africa, was an Ebola outbreak. And it flew to Dallas, ten minutes away from us. Yeah. And our ward had been on the same. So one of the, let's see, the nurses that had treated the Ebola patient, she flew out of Dallas to somewhere else. And our ward, I think the teenagers were flying to Trek, and they flew on the same, on the same plane, like one flight after her. And so our ward was just a mess for the next week after that had happened, after we found out. They all got letters from um, from the government and the FAA, from yeah. the CDC. CDC. And it was so scary. And I was like, this is it, Josh. This is it. We're all going to die. It's happening. This is the thing that – this is the end. Like, mm. This is before COVID, right? This is, this is 2014, Ugh. 2015, And you mix Ebola. that with, with – um, then I have my baby, and you mix that with like postpartum – anxiety and OCD and mm. I was a mess. Yeah. Layers mm. upon layers. So scrupulosity fixated in different areas. It wasn't always the food storage, mm-hmm. but we always had, you know, guns and food storage. And I had these things that you could put in the bathtub to fill them up with water before the water was contaminated. Yeah. Cause the book says there will be almost no clean water for drinking. And that was one of my biggest fears is I have a bait. I have two babies. Like how am I going to get them water? So you had these bathtub inflatables that you just fill up with water so you have drinking water. Before the just, the, the government corrupts the line of water or whatever. And oh. I always thought it was kind of odd, but I just played along because this was like my father-in-law and yeah. and just, you know, part of the family. I wanted, you know, to be part of the family. And yeah. we didn't talk about sports. We talked about prepping. Um, that was the only thing we could have in common. Mm. So I put on a face to try to fit in and... So, yeah, but it was always extreme. Well, I, uh, I think this is a good place. I, I, there's so much more I want to hear. Things are going to get really intense when we start talking about the visions of glory book. And I'll just say again, this is Tom Harrison's book, uh, Utah therapist, Tom Harrison, his book, visions of glory. It has, is now been identified as an inspiration to alleged murders, Chad Daybell, and Lori Vallow. Uh, alleged abuser, uh, Tim Ballard of Operation Underground Railroad, um, imprisoned, abusive, allegedly abusive therapist, Jody Hildebrandt, as well as Judy Rowe, as well as, uh, you know, others. (laughs) It just seems like Mormon prepper neo-fundamentalism is in chaos right now with so much crime and disorder and death. And this book, Visions of Glory, um, 
you know, in, inspired by the stories of, of Tom Harrison seem to be at, at the, at the heart of all this mayhem. So we that don't go away, come right back for part two, because we're going to talk about, uh, this book, um, you know, Kim's dad, the avow movement, the prepper movement, and their perspectives on on watching that relatively up close unfold. And then, you know, how that affected their own journey. But your dad knew Chad, Chad Daybelt, correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, Julie Rowe and Rod Meldrum and all these characters, uh, you know, all these things are really interwoven. So thank you so much. Uh, Josh and Kim for your willingness to tell such powerful and vul vulnerable st stories in part one. Uh, thank you, Margie, for being here and for being co-host. And we're super, we're super excited to come right back for part two after a break. Thanks. Thank Appreciate you. you both. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on Mormon Stories. Uh, we rely on your donations to uh, survive and to continue. We lose recurring donors every month. So, I will just ask that if you value this type of content, if you want to see it continue, we really do need you to sign up as a monthly donor if you're able to. So you can go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor, and all uh, we're transparent in our finances, uh, and all that you donate will go towards our cause, which is creating content to provide informed consent for Mormons and never Mormons and questioning Mormons, but also uh, to support Mormons in transition um, as well. Give a quick shout out for your YouTube channel as well, just for those who don't know about it. So Sweet Red Poppy is the YouTube channel. It's on all the platforms. So YouTube, obviously, but it's on Pinterest, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, it's DIY crafting and sewing content. Mm -hmm. uh, we have online courses, PDF, eBooks, Lots of free patterns and files, over 350 blog posts on the website. Kim created it all uh, from home and started this huge business and really helped a lot of people learn how to craft cricket machines, sewing machines, uh, even a quilting course that's coming out soon. She's quite the creative and so so talented. Thanks. Brilliant. <laughs> And this is a long shot, but are you wearing any clothes you made? Not today. Okay. okay. No. She went shopping for more <laughs> stories. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Kim and Josh. Thanks, Margie. Thanks, everyone. And come right back for part two of our interview with Kim and Josh Coffin. Uh, thanks, everybody.